Hello, everybody. This is a very interesting and special um, episode of the John Cast. I have with me today somebody who I have been uh, acquainted with for a while, named Travis Anderson, and we have had what you might call an adversarial relationship on social media for a while. And I found it very interesting because after the Robert debate um, that I just recently had. Um, a new dialogue started up between Travis and I, and it was, again, kind of uh, heated. And it ended up with uh, sort of a, a opportunity to have a debate between him and I. Well, we ended up having a phone call conversation uh, a number of days ago, and it was something of a uh, I don't know, you might call it a heart to heart or a, a parting of the clouds. I feel like we actually understood each other and we really got a lot of that dirty laundry out of the way and cleared up some misconceptions and uh, saw eye to eye. And so I just am always interested in bridging the gap between right and left, conservative, liberal, Christian, um, Muslim, whatever it is. And, you know, I, I would allude to the video I produced a while ago called Christians Stop Making This Mistake. And so go watch that if you haven't already. But basically the gist is treating people with dignity and respect regardless as to whether or not you agree with them, regardless as to how they treat you to be truly Christ-like. And that's something that I've struggled with and a lot of other people struggle with. Um, but I'm really excited about this, uh, this uh, debate that we're going to be having tonight because there's no longer any more of that uh, heat. There's no longer, I think, any more of that contention. It's going to be more of a laid back, polite debate or a somewhat structured um, sharing of beliefs and a discussion will ensue. And I think this is what would you say, emblematic of what I would like to see happen in the country and in the world where you have two sides who maybe fiercely disagree. And I, I just want people to see that no matter how fiercely you can disagree, you can come together and you don't have to end up holding hands and singing Kumbaya, but you can come together and respect each other and show respect for each other. However you much uh, however, however much you may disagree. So with that being said, tonight, uh, Travis and I are going to be discussing or debating whether or not a universal apostasy happened um, in the world of Christendom following, I presume, the death of the apostles. Um, and so, Travis, I I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself however you want, and then whenever you see fit, you can go ahead and kick it off. We're going to, I believe, have Travis start off with his position, and then we'll move on to my uh, position, and then we'll uh, go on to have a, an actual sort of back and forth conversation. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that, John. Um, yeah, as you, as you indicated, I think that our, our interactions have been relatively caustic online. I don't think that that was either of our intent. I think it was just um, one of the, 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 the confusions that happens when you do you or do Facebook or YouTube or any other social media interaction. And the problem with it is, is that the majority of interaction communication with people is getting to where it's not done in person. And I think that that nonverbal aspect of communication is missing. And I think that your viewers and those that continue to engage and are trying to do so productively need to recognize that you don't know the person on the other side and trying to label them as anything really other than just the words that they've said is probably a foolish endeavor on your part. And what you're doing is you're shutting out the possibility of learning something. A lot of what I've learned over the past several years with, with interactions on online and in social media have been predicated on the understanding that um, I, I, the great Jordan Peterson, who's pretty popular now, um, says, always assume that the person you're speaking to knows something that you don't. And um, from a garbage collector to a president of a country, <clears throat> everybody knows something you don't. I don't for one second believe that, that John 
um, knows things that, um, or doesn't know things I, I don't. And certainly the, the opposite is true. Um, remembering too that the interactions between people are certainly very, um, well, well, not even that, but our, our experiences. I don't like the, I'm, I'm a conservative, I think. I consider myself that way. I don't technically like phrases like lived experiences or, or thinking that anecdotal stories matter that much in, in the long run, especially when you're trying to get to some kind of a factual conclusion, but certainly um, lived experiences do formulate the way people think and view the world. And so I think that that's certainly something that needs to be said. Um, as a way of background, I was born and raised in Texas. Um, I did go to school out of state. I have lived amongst my own Mormon people. Um, I have been a very active Latter-day Saint for most of my life. I did serve an LDS mission um, as a result of some, some, you know, problems that most people would, would certainly suffer from, um, family and things like that. I've had some doubts and some confusions, not necessarily in my faith tradition. I don't think like a lot of LDS people, I ever had the um, I don't think the crisis of faith many say that they did. I think that what I did mostly is growing up, I was encouraged to learn more about what other faith traditions were. Being raised outside of a predominantly LDS culture, for example, I attended a high school of about 3,000 students and only six of us were Mormons. And so that, that required that I engage with people on a very different level and didn't, wasn't raised with the, the presupposition that other people believed like I did. And so I would often attend churches of various different flavors with my friends and was very interested in religion and theology and history, specifically of Christianity, because that was predominantly what I, my beliefs tended towards. As I, as I continued to study. I studied some, some of that material formally and certainly less formally over the many years. Um, my, my profession, which is irrelevant, um, requires that I do a lot of reading. And so reading is something that I want to do. Um, with respect to tonight's discussion regarding a universal apostasy, the question, the question was posed, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, because of, as, as John indicated, one of the things that we did is we came to an agreement on what this event was supposed to constitute. So one of the things that I tried to do was, was, was control the question such that I win. And I think in our email interactions, John, back and forth, I was effectively indicating that I win. Well, I, I talked to a, another Robert that you might be familiar with. Um, I'm not going to say his name, but he indicated, I don't know much about the Orthodox Church and its beliefs. I presumed that Orthodoxy was effectively Roman Catholicism without a Pope and beards and funny hats. Not that Catholics don't wear funny hats, but the Orthodox wear funnier hats, I think. But the beards are cool. So in the process of doing that, we uh, formulated the idea, I guess, that would be a similar debate between a, a Mormon and a Catholic in that there, there wasn't a universal apostasy. Surely, I think, John, you'd agree that there was an apostasy, correct? Um, it would, I mean, an apostasy. I think there have been many apostasies, to be sure. But, uh, but not within the Orthodox faith. Um, within the Orthodox faith, I mean, you would... You, you could classify the various anti-Nicene heresies as apostasies from the Orthodox Church, such as Gnosticism or Valentinianism or, you know, and pick it, pick one, you know, Sabellianism. Right. right. And so certainly there have been a history of, of apostasies. Um, I think you would maintain, as would I, that the, the church that you attend is, is God's one church. Correct. With that. Okay. And that's unique, I think, amongst um, those who are adherents to a faith tradition like that. 
Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses would hold to a similar view. Um, Orthodox, of course, as you mentioned, Roman Catholics would also believe that their church is the one true church of, of Christ and God. And certainly there are other denominations that would hold to something similar like that. There are some that people believe hold to that view and actually don't, but they do have some doctrinal belief or perspective within their theology that lends them to a truth claim. And I think that as a missionary church, any missionary church who's actually seeking converts has to have some hook that they can get people interested in their tradition by virtue of suggesting that it is exclusive in some way. And, and a general, within the Latter-day Saint faith tradition, um, we believe, as one of the articles of our faith indicates, that all, all faith traditions, all beliefs in any kind of a deity have truth. Truth is not exclusive to the Latter-day Saints. And I, I don't know if the Orthodox would agree with that. Yes, we have a concept called logos spermaticos, which uh, logos, rationale, reason, spermaticos, sperm, seed. And the idea is that kind of similar to what you're saying, we would say that we have the fullness of the truth, but this right. is not to rule out um, other belief systems or faith systems as having truth. Okay, yeah, and so we'll, and we'll get back into this. I'll, I'll, let me do a kind of a statement. Um, I'm kind of rambling a little bit to, to kind of give some background on my on my opinions and where they come from, but I'll, I'll get into the meat of what we were discussing here in a second. So the the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints uh, formally believes that as a result of a universal or general apostasy, I don't know that those terms are necessarily exclusive within each other, but certainly we believe that there was a general or universal apostasy that occurred not in any specific time, but certainly within the few centuries following the first century of the Christian era, wherein Jesus of Nazareth um, called apostles, men who were specifically designated to serve as missionaries and to spread that message that he, he delivered. Um, we believe, as many Christians do, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah who was long anticipated we believe that in his messianic role, it was foreordained before the world was created that he serve as a redemptive sacrifice or atonement and therefore reconcile fallen man back to God. And so within that, there's a lot of baggage, certainly in what I just said. Many Christians would probably agree with much of what I just said, not have much of a disparity or difference with that. But certainly one of the things that we find is, is more exclusionary to our particular faith tradition is the idea that Christ formally um, created a structure upon which a church, and by church, I think that we agreed um, before we had this discussion with several terms. Um, again, John, I'm not trying to hold you to anything. If you disagree with any of these definitions as we've as we put in a little document that we exchanged back and forth, um, certainly you can you can raise those those uh, objections at any time. But at, at present, um, we agreed a church was a system of governance overseeing those identifying as saints. As in our church, we call ourselves the Latter Day Saints or Saints because we believe that that was the term that those who followed after Christ, as they were preached to by those who preached to them, and they constituted a body. Now, necessarily, they weren't all one body, certainly, because geography would have kept them from being all unified together. But we believe that each of the, these, these people called themselves saints. Later, of course, they were called Christians, Christ worshipers, or Christ followers, however you want to interpret the, the term as it's contained in the New Testament text. But certainly these groups were following after the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, believing that he was a messianic figure who, by virtue of his death on the cross and resurrection, had somehow redeemed them from sin and from death, which we believe are the two, two uh, occurrences that became incident to Adam and Eve's fall from the Garden of Eden. 
Now, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints maintains, um, I think, it's probably a similar claim to the Orthodox, that not necessarily that it is exclusionary to having truth, but that it is an exclusive repository for all truth. And that's typically the way that the phraseology I would use to explain that to people. We don't believe that all truth is exclusive, but as truth is revealed or develops, God's church is required to accept it wherever it comes from. Um, we believe all human beings can be and are inspired by the Holy Ghost. We think that that is something that um, evangelicals and most Christians would to some level of gradation agree with. But we believe that in consequence of his own mortal ministry, Christ um, ordained his apostles and with specific authority and powers to do certain things, including spread the gospel and maintain the church. In consequence of um, one of the one of the common um, claims that is made against the claim that there was a universal or general apostasy amongst the early Christians. Some people accuse or believe that what we're suggesting is there was no Christianity. That, that of course, is, is hyperbolic in, in its nature of that argument. We don't believe Christianity stopped. Certainly it couldn't have. Because had Christianity stopped in 1830, when Joseph Smith, what, what we believe reorganized the church formally, um, wouldn't have been a Christian prior to that part because Christianity wouldn't have existed. So Christianity in some form must have, have remained. However, the formal church organization structure, authority, powers, and revelatory experiences that were being um, manifested by the apostles had somehow stopped. Um, one of the main arguments that I maintain is the evidence that, that there was a universality in the apostasy is the closing of a scriptural canon. It's my understanding, and again, John, when it's your turn, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, and certainly most evangelical and Protestant faiths believe that the biblical texts, as they compose them, certainly there is distinctions between how they organize those texts, constitute a closed canon of scripture. Um, when they refer to scripture, they are referring to that canon. Latter-day Saints, when we refer to scripture, we're not referring exclusively to the old and new, the Nag Hammadi, the Apocrypha, or any of those texts. We're referring to scripture as it is accepted by our church, which we have four standard works. And that's why we call them the standard works. We don't refer to them as a canon necessarily. Each one is a canon, but the canon can be added to in, and expanded upon as we see with the, the ministry of Joseph Smith, our first prophet, who we ever believe was the instrument by which the, the church was restored. Now, in looking at the organization, certainly, I think we would agree that the apostles were somehow given authority. And one of the other objections that's often raised against the Latter-day Saints, and again, I think it's a misunderstood objection, but certainly we can contend with people on it, is found in Matthew 16. And verses 17 through, or actually 13 through 20, wherein Peter is and the other apostles are questioned regarding what, who, who and what they believe Jesus Christ is. And it's answered that he is the Christ or Messiah and they're, therefore the son of the living God. Um, Christ goes on to suggest that blessed are you in verse 17, Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not made it. As, as has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And he said, and I say unto you, thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And it's upon the church and the fact that Hades would not prevail against it that many contend that our, our mis we have a mistaken understanding that there could have been a universal apostasy, because certainly that would mean that, that, that Hades or hell was able to overcome this prophecy and make, make uh, Jesus a liar. We don't, of course, don't view it that way. That, that would be to indicate that 
all Mormons who've read the Bible, specifically this chapter, don't have enough common sense to read it with some kind of an understanding that would negate that argument. And certainly we do. Um, in looking at the apostasy, we believe that the New Testament texts are pretty replete with evidence throughout, wherein the local members of these church organizations or churches throughout the, the Greek and Roman empires are, are falling away. Um, many, many occurrences where Paul, in fact, one of the purposes of many of his letters is to call local congregations to return to the faith, to avoid um, listening to other gospels or other spirits or other types of prophesying, preaching, or teachings that run contrary to what he and the other apostles had previously taught them. We believe that the organization of the apostolic body was such that it, it promulgated itself. We believe that one of the first new apostles that it is evidence that that apostolic quorum or group was to remain in force and to be reconstituted is evidenced by the calling of Matthias after the death of Judas and subsequently Paul. Now we know that, that Paul and Matthias, some people believe Matthias was not a legitimate apostle um, because of the differences between the callings of the 12 and himself. Um, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't accept those claims and don't believe that there's much scriptural merit to them. Paul on the other hand had a visionary experience and was called. I think very few would believe that Paul was not an apostle. Certainly considering his, his writings constitute the majority of the New Testament manuscripts and the texts upon which people rely, nobody's going to argue that, well, nobody that believes in Christianity is going to argue Paul was not apostolic. Now, where I think we would differ is the idea that after the deaths of these apostles, which there again, and this is where I want to make clear, the church doesn't have a, the deaths of the apostles apostasy. That's not the position of the church. The position of the church is that apostasy began as people began to kill the apostles. We believe that these events were revealed and that they are spoken about in scripture. We believe that Christ understood that the church itself, if for no other reason than a very practical argument could be made, that as these 12 uh, separated out into the empire to spread the message that Jesus had wrought, which is his, the, the message of his, his death, ministry, and resurrection. Um, we believe that as they were sent into the empire, that certainly um, that would make very difficult the idea that they could come back together. We believe that with that in mind, plus the hostility, the, the, the temperature, the context in which the apostles were preaching, that that would negate the capacity of them to formally come and reconstitute their body. And as a result of that, um, their deaths constituted a secession in the apostolic period, as many people call it. And certainly following that, without the direct guidance from these inspired men, as well the understanding that their revelatory writings and teachings would continue that the church slowly fell into a transitional period where it began to rely on interpretation rather than revelation. Now, when I use the word revelation, oftentimes people misunderstand that as well. Revelations are not always forthtelling future events. Um, I think the more common term in the church formally is that a revelator is a foreteller, which means somebody who is apprised of current events and through the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of it to be able to foretell what is going to occur if events are not altered or otherwise changed. And we think that the, that the, um, the record of early Christianity is very clear with respect to that. And again, John, I, I'm going to kind of close up here. I've been talking for quite a bit, but um, I'm not sure how, how long I've been talking or if you're timing me, but um, in, in consequence of that period, there are many writings from um, the patristics, the church fathers. There are also many writings from found in the, in the scriptural canon of the biblical texts, wherein the, the apostasy is demonstrated, if not overtly 
prophesied that it would occur. It was occurring during the New Testament writings. We can see evidence of that. Um, many, many groups were, were kind of falling astray. So um, without reconstituting their number, um, those men were left with a very subjective argument as to whether or not whatever authority they had to continue the formal work, which we believe was uh, the preaching of Christ and him crucified, as is mentioned in the New Testament. But in, in connection with that, as we see in Acts 2, calling people to repentance, faith in Jesus Christ, the receipt of official immersive baptism and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Ghost, and then it descending on those who receive it. Um, without these few formal ordinances and principles, the church fell into error and it began to change these fundamental practices into something that they no longer resembled at the time that Joseph Smith began to question um, I'm not going to go into the restoration too much. I don't know that that's really relevant. We can maybe talk about that during a question period and certainly have a, a discussion about what we view that to be um, as you're interested. Um, but the much of what we appeal to is history with respect to support for this. Um, and and uh, I think that in looking at some of the conditions that the effects of the apostasy, what caused it, were both internal within the church, its alterations of practices, the, the, con the combination and the creation of a scriptural canon, which in my, in my view um, is, is one of the worst events that, that occurred in early Christendom when groups of men, well-thinking, pious in their meaning, decided to basically close the heavens and preclude God from continuing to reveal doctrines, clarify doctrines, and allow groups of men to separate out and devise their own philosophies. And we believe that in consequence of that, they would have been imposed upon and influenced by the philosophies within the areas in which they live. And so those ideas which maybe made sense philosophically weren't consistent with the teachings of the early apostles and so we believe that sometime i i would say by nicaea the apostasy was probably concluded i think that's a pretty common consensus among latter-day saints but apostasy didn't stop then apostasy would not have ended then um, as you know, in the Orthodox faith, I know that there was a schism between both the Eastern and the Western churches in about the 10th century or so. And so that schism would have been an apostasy where um, each church went south of each other and went at odds with each other. There would have been another apostasy in some way with the Protestant Reformation and Luther. As Luther's churches broke off and fragmented further apostasies, as people begin to change the doctrines, change the ordinances, change the perspectives. And we believe that all of these constitute and necessitate a restoration. Now, the idea of apostasy or general universal apostasy is not new. Most, I think, with very few arguing to the contrary, would agree that Judaism at the time of Christ's mortal life would have not been in an in a an apostasy. It, it, it in itself was fragmented. People disagreed about points of doctrine, even who and what the Messiah was and could be. And I think that many rejected Christ for that reason. So even in a state of apostasy, Christ constituted a church, a restorative action. We believe these actions recurred. They're very common throughout history. None of them would serve as evidence that the gates of Hades prevailed upon God or his work among the children of men. Certainly, if indeed our claim to a restoration is correct, the church fell asleep, but then was reconstituted or resurrected, however you want to view it. And that's what we believe occurred in, in the mid-19th century. Terrific. Thank you very much for that thorough and well-worded 
um, explanation of your views on the subject. Um, I'm going to give a sort of more scriptural approach. I really thought about how I wanted to approach this, and I figured the back and forth between you and I will probably constitute the, the meat and potatoes of the video. So I I'm going to give that as well. I've got okay. a bunch of references and I wasn't going to sit here and quote John and Paul. Yeah. So maybe uh, I, I'll give my uh, rebuttal, so to speak, and then we can use that as a springboard into the Q or not the Q and a, <laughs> the, uh, the, que the back and forth, the questions we talked about. Sure. So basically I just want to, be making a case for why there is no scriptural indication that there would ever be a universal apostasy in the new covenant church. And to begin, I'll reiterate what we agreed upon for definitions, which are one apostasy being the act of rejecting former religious beliefs and or practices, the act of abandoning the church universal or great apostasy. Number two, the LDS church defines the apostasy as a process by which priesthood authority, including the keys to direct and receive revelation for the church was taken from the earth as evidenced by closing the scriptural canon and changing of doctrines, practices, and principles. Now for context, um, the great apostasy hypothesis is one that actually didn't begin with Mormonism, but rather with Protestantism. Reformers like uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Cotton Mathers, they all believed that the early church had been led into apostasy by the papacy, going so far as to identify the papal office itself with the Antichrist. And you'll generally find two marking points for when the alleged great apostasy began. Either A, it happened during the lives of the apostles themselves, or B, during the lifetime of Emperor Constantine. And uh, we've heard Travis's take on that, which I think is a pretty good starting point for discussion. But Reformation and Restoration have more than this in common. They generally cite the same scriptures. And uh, so I kind of want to go through each of these and provide uh, what I believe to be a pretty sound exegesis for why you can't read a universal apostasy into these. Chief amongst these that I see cited most often is 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. And this is when St. Paul is addressing the Thessalonians regarding their concerns over whether the second coming has already begun. And he says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now, Paul tells the Thessalonians to not be shaken in mind or troubled because the coming of Jesus had not come. And in fact, Paul states it cannot come until the falling away happens and the man of sin, whom scholars generally recognize to be the Antichrist, is revealed. Once the great falling away and the Antichrist come on the scene, we will know the end times have begun and the day of the Lord is here. So if the great falling away has already happened and the Antichrist has already come, if you think it was Constantine, or if you think that it's already present uh, via the papacy, then I guess the day of the Lord has already come too. According to Jesus' parable of the wheat and tares, um, this falling away or apostasy will not be universal though, and uh, it will never overcome his church. Both will grow together uninterrupted, and at the end times, they will both be separated. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 12, Jesus states, quote, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of their increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now, I think it's important to note that Jesus says many, or paloi, will, fail, will fall away. What he does not say is that all of them will fall away. If Jesus had wanted to say that everybody would fall away, he would have said that all, or panton, would fall away. And you see this again uh, throughout scripture in similar verses. In 2 Peter 2, 1 through 2, um, another common great apostasy proof text, we see the same, uh, which is poloi being used instead of panton, when he writes that many will, quote, follow their depraved conduct and bring the way of truth into disrepute. Now, the other big humdinger I see used to defend the idea of universal apostasy is Amos 8, 11 through 12, which reads, Behold, the days come that I will send forth a famine into the land, not of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
and the people shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Now, I think it's important to consider that in Amos 2.6, the prophet makes it clear that everything written from that verse forward is directed at Israel and is a response to their sins at that time. It isn't a prophecy directed at New Covenant Christians who would come 18 years later after the Incarnation. The New Testament authors, therefore, never cite this passage in reference to their own times. So the idea that Amos is prophesying of the New Testament church's apostasy or alleged apostasy simply, I don't think, can be derived from this text. But speaking to the possibility of a future apostasy, I think this is an interesting question because it seems to me that Israel never did experience a total apostasy. Even at their lowest points, there were always true believers amongst the apostates. And a good example I'd like to cite is 1 Kings 19, which comes after Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal. Yet even after this victory, idolatry continued to reign in Israel, and King Ahab was still persecuting God's people. In verse 10, Elijah complains that he was the only faithful Israelite left. He says, quote, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What's interesting is God responds by correcting him, saying that there were other believers still present amongst the Israelites. He says, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Secondly, God deals differently with the church than he deals with Israel. The church is under the new covenant, which is greater than the old covenant that Israel was under. Both Ezekiel and Jeremiah contrast the new covenant with the temporary and breakable nature of the old covenant. They say this new covenant will replace the old law that the Hebrews broke. We will receive a new heart, a new spirit, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, as well as true holiness. The authors of Hebrews use these passages to contrast the temporary nature of the old covenant with the more permanent and abiding nature of the new. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 7 and 13 state, quote, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So if the great apostasy theory is true, then we cannot really say that the new covenant is greater than the old, because it was broken just like the old. Essentially, the great apostasy theory makes God into a liar who breaks his own promises, but scripture states that God never lies or breaks his promises. When God promises that hell cannot prevail against his church, he means it, and we can rest assured knowing that he will never allow his church to be wiped off the earth. He tells his apostles in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail or withstand against his church. He tells his apostles via the parable of the wheat and tares that his church will continue to grow alongside uninterrupted until the second coming. In Matthew 28, 20, he tells his apostles that he would be with the church until the end of the world. And in John 16, 13 through 18, he tells his apostles that the Holy Spirit would guide the church into all truth. And according to Hebrews 12, 28, this is a kingdom that, quote, cannot be shaken. Paul uses explicit terms to eliminate the possibility of universal apostasy in his letter to the Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 23, he describes the church as, quote, Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And this church, he says, is, quote, built on the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Paul goes so far as to describe the church as being the instrument that God has chosen so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Paul then reminds his audience that the church must have apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. Why? For the equipment of the saints, for building up the body of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Paul tops it off by stating in Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, that the church of Jesus Christ would be a blessing to all generations forever and ever. And according to Colossians 1, 18, Christ is the head of the church and we are the body. It is therefore unthinkable in a post-incarnation world that the church was decapitated. In a similar fashion, scripture tells us repeatedly that Christ is the husband of the church and we are his bride. 
It is therefore also unthinkable in a post-incarnation world that the perfect husband would abandon his wife that he promised to be with now and forever and to the ages of ages. Jesus did not stand by and watch as his bride was murdered, nor did he abandon the wheat to the tares or turn his back as the wolves ravaged his flock into oblivion. He is, as he said, I think, a good and faithful shepherd. And with that, I yield the rest of my time. Well, that was very interesting, John. <laughs> I'm not as, uh, as uh, eloquent and well-worded as you. I have to script my stuff out, at least for the... Uh, the opening and closing statement stuff. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did because here's the difference between us. You're going to remember what you said. And I haven't got the foggiest clue what I said. I took some notes on uh, points of discussion from what you said. So, well, and I'll tell you this, what, what I, what I stated are things that I know. And so it, it's not, not difficult for me to go back and reference what I said, but okay. no. And, and so you know, I, we can do this. However, we talked about, you know, question answer. And, you know, I think that at the time, and I'll tell our audience at the time that we were kind of formulating this discussion, we were, I think, I was thinking you were going to be a complete jerk. And I think you thought equal, if not worse as me. Um, we've since talked. And I think that in, in the spirit of trying to have a discussion uh, and not, not talk over one another, and I'll tell you the last one, the last one of your debates that I saw. And again, John, I'm not trying to run you down or anything, but <laughs> the, the debate, the debate wasn't really much of a debate. Um, I, I like Robert. Um, he's a great guy. Um, and I'm not saying his performance was completely uh, terrible or anything, but certainly I, I disagree with a lot of what he said. And that's, it's something that is, that is unique and actually is, and a reason I bring that up is it is a point, a salient point in respect response to many of what, many of the things that you, you itemize. So um, I wanna ask you a couple of questions and I guess we can just go back and forth because what I'd like to do is just go through and respond point by point to what you said. Sure. Um, mostly because I know that you, you believe that that was an excellent ex exegesis of the scriptures. Um, I, I of course disagree. I don't think that that was that was consistent with with what the texts are actually saying. Um, I think that much of what you're doing is imposing a preconceived belief belief system on those texts, and and you're also misidentifying what my claim is. And so let me ask you this: Is there a corollary concept in Eastern Orthodoxy to moral agency? And let me explain how that is. Oftentimes Mormons will use terms like free will, free agency, or free or agency. We often shorten it to agency. Our leaders have defined that, that term a little bit more clearly in reference to scriptural accounts where it talks about moral agency. And that's effectively our free will. And I'll tell you right now, um, before you answer the question, as a Latter-day Saint, I do not believe any other faith tradition believes in moral agency or accepts it. But certainly I'd love to hear what the, what the Orthodox position is regarding moral agency, how you understand it, and, and certainly what you believe it, or people are allowed to do. Yeah, uh, the Orthodox Church, to my understanding, firmly embraces the notion of free will and rejects the Calvinist interpretation of predestination. We do not believe that people are foreordained for either heaven or hell. Um, we view, we go so far as to even view hell as a place that one puts him or herself in, that someone chooses for themselves. Hell is something that you have to essentially be committed to. And so, yeah, I, I would say that we're probably more in line with our views on free will. No, and I, and I, I think that, I think that um, surface wise we would be, but as we, as we mind that philosophy further, and that's why I say, I take a very, a very strong position against other faith traditions, acknowledging free will. Mostly that has to do with our understanding of creation and where we came from, the purposes of life and why we're here. I don't think that the theological positions of other faith traditions support the acknowledgement of free will. And I'll tell you, tell you in, in another question, if we truly have free will, 
how would God prevent an apostasy from everybody apostatizing? How, how would he secure that? I think it would have to be accomplished through the same means that he uses throughout the Old Testament and through all of history, which is through fallible people, which is through messed up people. So God uses people, events, and, you know, providence to achieve his, to achieve his ends. Right. And, and so, and that, and that's where I'm, I'm puzzled because that, that to me sounds like, and of course I could be mistaken in what you're explaining, but that sounds like there's some imposition of God's purposes on humans in a sense that he will require or force, coerce, or otherwise demand that humans act in a certain way so as to keep what you believe is a promise. And so what I'm looking at is I'm looking like, um, so you, you spoke about many falling away and that many, many doesn't mean all, right? And I, I get that. I think that that's a perfectly reasonable um, understanding of some of those passages. The problem with it is, is that I would agree with those. I don't believe all fell away and that's not a universal apostasy. And that wouldn't be, that wouldn't even be what we would define. Certainly many did not fall away from the truth, but does that mean that apostasy or universal apostasy didn't occur? No. And I don't, I don't see how you, you think that a few people maintaining whatever would, would help the governance of the church in light of what you explained with other passages survive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and what comes to mind for me is the Arian controversy, which you may know preceded the, uh, the Nicene Council. Right. Um, there's a quote from, I forget which church father it is, but I believe it happened in the events that followed Nicaea, because it wasn't just like, okay, here's the Nicene Creed, this is what we believe. By that time, Arianism had spread so far, and it had influential people in high places um, that you had Arianism start to affect even Emperor Constantine and following emperors who came and after you had Julian the Apostate. But what I'm getting at is there were people during that time who believed that this was it. This was the great falling away this is a, a sign of the times, get ready, because the great falling away is happening, so watch out for the man of sin, the Antichrist, um, it's coming. And there's a church father, the one that I wanted to, to mention, I forget who he is, but he basically says, um, the world woke up the next morning and groaned because it found itself Aryan. So kind of like when I was citing First Kings with Elijah and stuff, there can be crises, there can be an Aryan controversy, there can be uh, great struggles with modalism, um, but this isn't to say, I think, that the entire church will ever fall away. And certainly the early church fathers at that time too, I, I have not seen anything in what I've read to indicate that they believed that everybody during that time would fall away, that all quote unquote orthodox would be dead and swept away and totally supplanted that a universal apostasy would happen, but rather that the falling away that would happen would be great. No, and I get that. And that's, that's where I'm confused as to your, your, your argument as far as, as it's, it's, it's not what it's, it's not a clear understanding of what the LDS position is in the sense that we, we cannot, as I, as I stated, we cannot believe, for example, that Christianity was swept from the earth. And, and what you're describing between many and all and the phraseology in those passages um, would necessitate that there was a wiping away of Christianity and that we believe Christianity would have had to have been reconstituted with Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was a Christian. Um, for all intents and purposes, he believed Jesus of Nazareth was the son of God he read the Bible diligently, as many in his area did. He prayed. He attended churches. He submitted himself to 
the preaching of those around him. And he simply just questioned what they stated. But there were camp meetings and other things occurring in the United States at that time. So we're not saying that there was no Christianity. And so I, that, and that's not the claim of a universal apostasy. And that's where I go back to the closing of the scriptural canon. So let me ask you this. Anybody, you know what, John, you can ask me a question. In fact, I've asked a couple. Oh, no, Go you're ahead. fine. I'd like to follow, put put a bookmark in that, and we don't okay. have to follow my response up because I don't want to get no, us no, too no. derailed. Because I, 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 let me tell you, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you know, just so the viewers, I will take over if you allow me. <laughs> well, I have no problem stepping in no, and will, getting us back on track start, if necessary. I will turn this into interrogatory after interrogatory, and I'll just grill you all night, but. Yeah, um, and that's and that's fine by me. With my own rambling, but and I don't want I don't want to do that. So, yeah. So first, I would say I'm, I, I I look at those who indignantly say Mormons aren't Christians. I I always look at them a little bit skeptical. I'm always very cautious to play that game. I don't think it's productive or fruitful. So I, I'm with you, um, and I understand your position. Uh, and from what I recall of the document we drafted up to get us on the same page, pun intended, uh, is that it's more to do with valid priesthood authority, if I recall right. Yeah. So because you even had, I mean, you had Valentinians, you had modalists, you had people of all different stripes and colors claiming to have valid priesthood authority or to be the true uh, believers. And so... Yeah, I'm. I'm not trying to uh, straw man you. No, 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 and I'm not. And I'm not saying that you are. I, I get that. Um, now, I again, I I believe that you did straw man some of our beliefs with your prior debates. We can talk about that. But in the sense that, in the sense that, I, I get that. What I'm saying is, is that for purposes of of Latter Day Saint theology, uh, with regards to a, a universal apostasy, we do not maintain that Christianity swept from the earth. And it does have something to do with authority. And so for us, and just to, just to be clear on it, kind of uh, not, not beat around the bush or anything to that effect, but what we would believe is that the apostolic group, we believe that was actually an official group, not people who followed after the church fathers were not apostles. They may have, you know, people often say that the church fathers were apostolic or something to that effect, or that those who followed after were apostolic in looking at which which text we were going to include in the scriptural canon one of the qualifiers that they looked to was were the texts apostolic meaning did they come from an apostle or were they written by a companion or follower of that apostle and even with that respect you've got you've got texts being included in the canon that they're admitting and eh, you know paul didn't write this john didn't write this um, Matthew didn't write it, Luke did, but Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, or a friend of Paul, or a colleague of Paul. Mark was maybe Peter's secretary, so that's okay. Maybe Peter dictated Mark, right? And so it's apostolic in that respect, but the Latter-day Saints don't, don't really view it that way in the sense that we believe that the apostles, there were 12, and that those 12, one passed away, and that it was a reconstituted body. We believe that the addition of Matthias and the later addition of Paul demonstrate that that quorum of men was intended to remain and reconstitute itself over time. The current Latter-day Saint Church is founded on a foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus being the chief cornerstone. We have a quorum of apostles and we believe that those are official positions in the church. For whatever purposes that we identify with them and we believe that that is necessary and should have continued now i'll make one more point and the reason we believe that is because i'll ask you this question and you can answer it or you can re-ask me another one how do you know the arians weren't correct how do you know that the modalists weren't correct or the civilians weren't correct or the montanists weren't correct or the gnostics weren't correct and not your own faith tradition how do you know? Uh, there's a couple ways I would go with that. I would, I would of course, argue that scripture and the consensus of the early church fathers preceding the Arian controversy refute Arianism. 
Uh, there's also the fact that Arianism was something local. It was developed in the area that Arius presided over. So it was an innovation. Uh, it wasn't present uh, in a, what would you call, uh, a general Catholic universal sense like the beliefs of the general Christians were. And then thirdly, I would say, uh, and this, this could segue into something else, we catch flack from Protestants who accuse us of relegating, like we don't believe in sola scriptura. Right. Uh, and that's because we accept the ecumenical councils to be authoritative. Now, now you, if you, you accept this as seven, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so what's interesting is if you read uh, the documents from uh, Nicaea, like the deposition of Arius and such, they talk about how the council was divinely inspired on, and they specifically mention under Jesus Christ and the apostle, which I believe they were referring to Paul. So we don't take only the, the old and new Testament to be uh, produced under the wings of the Holy spirit, so to speak. Right. And, and, and that's where, and that's where I, I don't really understand that, that claim, I guess, because the, the identification of, well, and, and I'll tell you, just to, to make a, a, a point, I'll bring this up. Oftentimes when I talk to evangelicals or other Protestants, one of the, the claims that they'll make is that, you know, and it, it's kind of an absurd, and I understand that it's not, it doesn't formally represent what they actually think or believe, but they'll often say that Jesus finished it all on the cross. It all ended with Jesus. He's the final prophet, quoting from Hebrews. And so, They'll, they'll try to make this argument that he's the great high priest, he's the last one, all the priesthood invested with him. And what's interesting about that comment is it's self-defeating because they're reading texts that were created years or decades after the events that they're recording, and they're saying what, and, 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 and the reality is Jesus didn't write those. So who must have written them? Somebody they view as authoritative. So in the church, authority to do things, the authority to, to bind on earth and have it bound in heaven, the keys of the kingdom that we believe were delivered to Peter and the other apostles are the authority to speak on behalf of God to interpret both events and scripture. And the problem that I see with the idea that there could not have been a universal apostasy is the understanding that you're appealing to groups of men who often disagreed with one another. Now, certainly there were disagreements that we see in Acts and in the writings of Paul between Paul and I think it's, it's Acts 11 or 15 that Paul has a disagreement with Peter and James, and there was some kind of a something going on. Paul later submitted to James and accepted some, some Jewish washings, um, which people often wonder if that makes him still a Christian or whatever the case may be. But the reality of it is, is in, in process of doing that, those men held specific authority that they were divinely invested with by Christ and so and were ordained by the other members of that quorum, and that quorum remained a consensus of 12, and that body maintains their authority, and they were able to, to act and react to each other. So what happened is, is without that foundation of apostles and prophets, which we believe is the same thing, those, those bodies, you've got a divergence in the church. And what you're just saying is, well, their writings say we're apostolic. Our writings say we, can, we have a consensus. But a consensus among how many people and based on what philosophy? And so it doesn't mean that that philosophical ideology was correct. And it doesn't mean it was wrong, but it doesn't mean it was 100% correct. And it doesn't mean it wasn't tainted or corrupted in some way. You see what I mean? There's yeah. no way to maintain that argument. Uh, we, we view Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, I believe it's called, as right. the sort of prototype for the ecumenical councils. So the councils are viewed in light of Acts 15 and that kind of council, and they're modeled in the same way. And we view the decision that came out of Acts 15 as authoritative. And so we view ecumenical councils as authoritative in the same way. Now, we pass on 
valid priesthood authority by the laying on of hands through valid ordinances and such. And that is passed down from the apostles to their successors, the bishops. And so these bishops are those who are invested with this apostolic authority. And so the bishops are the ones who were invited to Nicaea, to Chalcedon, to Constantinople, to all of these councils that we, that we recognize as ecumenical. Right. So they're speaking with a very true and valid apostolic authority. Now that, just like you mentioned with Peter, James, um, Paul, that doesn't mean that they can't disagree with each other. Certainly they can. But uh, we, we take seriously the idea that when the church is gathered together, especially in an apostolic sense, um, Christ is very much present in guiding the events. And uh, one thing that I want to respond to as well, just because you've brought it up twice now, um, and maybe this isn't trying to like turn into a gotcha moment, but it, it's a genuine question. So you had Matthias replace Judas in order to fulfill prophecy right. uh, regarding that. So that brings the count back up to 12, but then right. Paul was called. So we have 13 apostles. So in the LDS church, you have a quorum of 12 in addition to a president, correct? The prophet, or is the yeah, prophet still amongst the 12? Right. So there's a quorum of 12 apostles, and then there is a prophet, and there are two counselors who are removed from that quorum, but the quorum of the 12 remains constituted as a quorum of 12. But the, and the prophet presides over the church. And that's why we believe in prophets and apostles. So and you again, have, so you have 15, one, sorry, go on. There's 15 men that we currently sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. And only okay. 12 of them are in the quorum of 12. So you have 12 apostles and one prophet and two counselors. Yeah. Um, who were the counselors in the New Testament church? That's a good question. Who was the prophet of the New Testament church? I don't think there was one, not in the sense that the LDS uh, are thinking. Right. I know that you probably would say Peter. I've heard that before. Oftentimes people believe Peter, James, and John were the first presidency. I've heard a lot of Latter-day Saints say that. I don't know that I necessarily agree or disagree. In fact, I'll tell you, I don't know. And I don't need to. Because okay. for purposes of my, again, that's, that's the distinction between us. And that to me is the apostasy. I don't have to go back and appeal to the Bible. Okay. Why would I need to? Uh, well, I mean, that's sort of the basis for which these claims are being made, right? No, it's not. The, the, the claims are being made independently. So that, and that's what, that's what my point is. How was the church constituted under Moses? I can't recall. <laughs> right. It's Moses. I mean, Moses was the was the guy. The Prophet and laity. Kid, right? Yeah. He had, and then the, the you know, they they constituted the, the tribe of Levi to serve as Leverite priests. Later there was an Aaronic priesthood. We believe that there is a, a constitution of an Aaronic. We believe that the Aaronic priesthood's duties and authorities were to some degree changed because of the apostate nature of the, of the Levites in holding that, that authority. We believe the priesthood of Aaron survives, but Aaron has no direct descendants. But if you can find one, they're automatically ordained with the Aaronic priesthood in that respect. So in that way, we do borrow back from Judaism. The scriptures don't serve as an authority in that respect for us. The scriptures okay. serve as a shadow of what used to be. The authority of the church is not vested in scripture, and it's not vested in councils or anything to that regard. It is vested in the 12 apostles and the prophet. And the prophet himself is the senior over them. So the way that it works in the hierarchy of the church is the prophet has the final say in the church. And that is the same organization that existed in the primitive church. There was, an, there was a, a final say, a final word on the matter. Paul subjects himself to the will of the others, right? He jokingly says that, you know, they're better apostles, they're super apostles. So I'm, I'm going to kowtow to them because he understands the pecking order. And in, in the church today, 
we have senior apostles, the top six, and junior apostles who have authority predicated underneath each other based on seniority. The senior apostle of the church is the president of the church, the, the senior apostle. Now, the understanding therein is I don't have to go back to scripture. I just have to say, look, John, hey, there were 12 apostles in the New Testament, and we have 12 now. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so, so you don't actually model the current organization of the church after the actual organization of the New Testament church. You do in one sense, but not fully. No, no, we, we wouldn't need to, but we do because that is what has been revealed as the proper structure. And we see it mirrored in the New Testament, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Because again, in, in our faith tradition, and I, I, I'm i not sure how the structure of the Orthodox Church is, but I think it, it's going to be relevant with respect to the argument of the universality or the nature of whether there was an apostasy, as I'm claiming. Because the problem with it is, is you've got a, 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 a group of clerics called whatever they're called. Um, I, I'm not, I, I remember that somebody's a metropolitan. That's a high-ranking bishop. And, and what is he? What is a metropolitan? What is his authority over the church? Um, ecclesiology is not my strongest suit, but if I recall right, I'm open to correction if anybody in the comments section wants to correct me, but if I, if I recall right, a metropolitan is a bishop who is in charge of a bigger area. It could be the Western United States, um, I don't think a metropolitan is the actual head of the particular patriarchate. So patriarchate would be the Serbian Orthodox Church, the Russian, uh, African, and so on. Um, and now are those under the umbrella of a singular organization structure or head? So of course the Roman Catholic Church, everybody um, goes back to Pope, right? Uh, um, Pope has the final say in matters of doctrine. Would, with Catholicism, that. yes. We have, so after the schism, to my understanding, we lost Rome, but we still wanted to have an ecumenical. Well, you didn't, you didn't lose it. You kicked <clears throat> it out, right? Okay. You excommunicated those <laughs> SOBs. <laughs> well, we, I, I, I think we actually excommunicated each other. Right. And, it's, and, that's it's I, and I, yeah, that was my understanding as well. You guys. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting too, though, just as a brief aside, um, my understanding is that the Great Schism didn't come to be known as the Great Schism until the Latins conquered uh, Constantinople, actually Byzantium, later in the Fourth Crusade. Until that point, uh, it was something thought of by the laity as, oh, it's something higher up, they're working it out, it's, you know, differences, it, it'll settle, it'll boil over and we'll be okay. But when the Latins conquered uh, Byzantium, uh, in the Fourth Crusade, it brought these kind of differences, this hostility, this tension down to the level of the common folk. No, and I get that. Yeah, and so my my issue with it is, and, and we have we actually had a debate once where, and again, not a formal debate or anything like that, but we had a back and forth on Facebook, one of our early ones, and I was reviewing it. I don't know if you saved all of them. Our conversations? No. Yeah, I saved them, John. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, so... <laughs> In going back and looking at those, because um, I learned a lot from them, because again, I'm not there to just be caustic and hostile, I'm there to learn. Now, but here's the other thing, and I'll tell your viewers, have the maturity to understand that the person you're talking to is not an authorized spokesperson for their faith tradition. Just as you said, I could be mistaken, I could be mistaken. Now, do I think I'm mistaken? Certainly not, or if I, if I thought I was mistaken, I'd change my position on something. But as it sits right now, I, I'm pretty well versed in, in LDS theology, doctrine, history, and practice, but I believe that what I'm the way I'm articulating it is correct. But but in that sense though, our understanding of scripture is more as a type, not an authority. The authority in the church is the prophet. It's the same organization and structure that God has repeated throughout the Bible. In fact, the only universal thing that occurs from Genesis to Revelation is that a prophet is leading a group and speaking for them and speaking to God, speaking to God and, and, and revealing what he wants revealed. 
That's the only universality in the scriptures. Beyond that, you've got contradictions, you've got certain inconsistencies, you've got disparities between old and between Hebrew and Greek text. And the reality of it is, is in doing that, what we have to look back to as, as those who are trying to not replicate, I mean, as unlike a lot of restorationists, Joseph Smith didn't pull open the New Testament and think, how do I reconstitute what was lost? He didn't do that, he didn't have to. He said, well, I'm just going to ask God what I should do. He's going to tell me. And that's our authority. And that's why LDS theology is so difficult to pin down. Yeah, I don't have a systematized theology. Yeah, I've, I've actually read um, the Mormon church being described as a theological in that regard. And certainly a lot of people have been frustrated because they'll say, uh, you know, Brigham Young uh, Adam, uh, Adam God theory. And they'll say, well, that was never doctrine. It was a personal belief. And so it's, it's kind of like trying to put a nail into a waterfall or a, you well, know. well, and just, just like, uh, you know, some of the things that you said, and, you know, in, in talking with, with uh, your discussion with Robert, um, there's a, there's an understanding, for example, that, um, I mean, you, you guys went off a little bit on, uh, God having actual physical sexual relationship with Mary. And I'll tell you what, did that actually occur? I haven't got the first damn clue. And that is actually the official position of the church. Now, and the reason that that is, is all we really know about that interaction is what the author of Luke stated in Luke 2, right? The, that the, the Holy, Holy Spirit Ghost overshadowed Mary. Yes. Right? And the power of the highest will come upon me, right? Now, I always ask people when they say, did you know, it's, it's blasphemy to say that the father had intercourse with Mary, right? And I always say, not necessarily, because where specifically in the text, speaking about that event, does it say that did not occur? I think that's kind of a slippery slope, though. You could really argue just about anything using that kind of methodology. No, no. And that's, that's what I'm saying, John, is that's, that's the difference in, in us speaking back and forth. When I met reference the prior discussion, one of the things that I kept asking you is what is scripture? What scripture. Is, yeah. What is scripture? Scripture is the writings of the church fathers, whether old or new Testament that have been canonized by the church. Um, and of course, the last little thing I would tack on is, as I said before, that isn't to say that scripture is the only authority okay so and one of the questions i asked you is when did we get scripture so the early jews um, were given certain dispensations with respect to their allegiance to rome or their pretended allegiance to rome with respect to their practices rome gave them a dispensation because of the age of their religion the the nature of their monotheistic religion the establishment of their temples the fact that in pagan pagan circles the Hebrew God was seen as very powerful and very worth identifying and recognizing. He had done some great historical things. And, you know, back in a day when they didn't have Google, if they knew that the God of the Hebrews could call down pillars of fire and destroy armies, I mean, that was the, th that was the stories. So you're going to give deference to that deity because you believe that it's a deity. But for a pagan who's just like, okay, your God's, your God's old. He's been around a lot. We're going to let you not worship our gods because it's contrary to your religion. Also, your religion is text-based. You know, they were of the book, as the, as the current Islam religion calls it. And the issue with it is, is that that, that text-based religion, that's a new thing. But look at what it led to. So Jesus was refuting that text-reliant religious doc dogma by reinterpreting and adding to. And that, to me, is the fundamental principle of Mormonism. We go back and we say, no, that's not what that meant. And we're adding to. That's the purpose. That's the function. And that, to me, is what necessitated a restoration. Because that fundamental principle of continuing, continuing to do that in the same pattern that we see in those texts. A prophet. Who was the prophet while well, Jesus was on the earth? Jesus. Before Jesus, who was it? John, right? After Jesus, who was it? There were 12. 
So Jesus had altered the methodology. Why? Because they're going to go out into all the world. There no longer was a prophet that stood on a, stood on a parapet and was able to t announce to Israel as there was with Moses and Malachi and Elijah and Isaiah. Instead of, of looking to one man and one prophet under a small covenant people, because it was a new covenant, as you indicated, it was of necessity changed, altered, because now we're giving it to the Greeks and to the, to the Gentiles. And so as they went and did that, it required a reconstitution. But what you're suggesting is a, a, a clergy that can be infinitely added upon, but never have that originally constituted body of the 12 apostles that Jesus indicated. So if I'm a scriptural literalist, where's your 12 apostles? Well, and that's where I think we get into some very important questions, because the apostles never made any attempt to maintain a continuing, enduring body of 12. They replaced uh, Judah in order to fulfill prophecy. Paul was called in a special sense, but maintaining an apostolic body of the church is something that they did do. Paul passes on uh, apostolic authority to Timothy, and we have all of these records showing the the laying on of hands, this, this path of ordination from the present all the way back to the apostles themselves. We have no prophet in the New Testament church, in the, uh, you know, post-ascension church. We have the apostles going out into the world and uh, true to what apostolos means, one who is sent out, they go out and they preach the gospel with no concern for preserving their own lives or for preserving a continuing body of 12. So when looking to, and you admitted this, I mean, you said that, you know, there's, there's no prophet per se in the New Testament church. There's 12 or 13 apostles. You made the distinction between, uh, no, 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 I, right. And that's what I'm saying is, is that, no, what I said is, is not that, not that there isn't one. I don't know which one more clearly would have been the head. It appears it's Peter. Yes, but and I think that the argument could certainly be made that it's Peter in the text. But again, that's called that's a subjective mining, looking for it, trying to find something that may be there and maybe not. That's going to be subject to disagreement, and that very act of disagreeing and trying to point to those texts as the source to clarify the disagreement is going to create a schism, and one of us is in apostasy. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, we've hit this before, but it's like, how do you determine like what is actually truth or what is actually authoritative? And so, you know, if you use scripture alone, just like the Protestants, you're going to find yourself in a pretty tricky situation because uh, the Mormons use scripture to justify their positions. The Protestants, the Catholics, the Orthodox, uh, what is it? Uh, Matthew 16, 18. You are Peter, and on this rock I will uh, build my kingdom, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Orthodox have an understanding of that. The Catholics have an understanding of that. The Protestants do. The Mormons probably do. So scripture alone, I think, is a, a, a very problematic way to determine truth, and I think we would probably be uh, in agreement on that. No, certainly we would be, and that's and that's where that's where it becomes more problematic are making this argument with somebody who's either Orthodox or Catholic, because they don't adhere to Sola Scriptura. And I get that. I, I understand that principle, certainly. But again, we're not looking back into history to determine what's what's relevant or revealed. And that's where we're, that's where we're going to be at complete odds with one another. I, the, the, the restoration of the gospel isn't evidenced by anything other than God calls a prophet. We can look back to the text and see, well, that's what God does. He calls prophets. And he tells the prophets to announce repent and, and follow me, repent and have faith, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the, that's the burden of the message of a prophet. Now, in consequence of doing that, prophets reveal what God wants, and they do so, and those words become scripture. Now, that's, that's the issue, is, is that the evidence that Joseph Smith was a prophet is the production of the Book of Mormon. Now, certainly your audience and those who who disagree with Latter-day Saint theology are going to come in with, oh, but the Book of Mormon and both the, but the Book of Mormon, and that's fine. I mean, you can dispute with what it is and disagree that it's ancient scripture that's been revealed and restored or whatever the case may be. That's fine. 
But the reality of it is the principle itself remains correct. And it remains the only consistent principle that flows throughout the biblical text and any text. The author is revealing, the author is prophetic, and the author is teaching. Whether or not they wrote their words down is really irrelevant in that regard. What I, what I find interesting is, from my perspective, just about everything you said could also be applied to Islam and to Muhammad. Certainly. Um, he, yeah, he, was a pro, he was a prophet called. Uh, right. He produced a book by similar right. means, uh, was approached by an angel. Right. Um, you know, you said the principle remains correct through like revealing, prophetic teaching, and all of that was stuff right. that uh, Muhammad claimed to have done. Right. So how do we delineate truth from lie when it comes to Islam? How, how do you how you delineate truth from lie when it comes to orthodoxy? Well, I, I think you have to take a sort of um, multifaceted approach. I would use history, uh, scripture, and patristics, and anal analysis of truth claims. Right. You make a decision as to what you want to create as an epistemological standard, and you apply it. That's all you're doing. And so if I, for example, look at Islam, which I've done, and I look at it, and I think that I owe it to that huge, gigantic religious movement to actually consider what they're saying. My problem with it is, is that they're identifying doctrine with respect to who and what they believe a deity is, is no different to me than orthodoxy or any other faith tradition. My own faith tradition creates a deity that I can actually acknowledge and understand. Um, when people tell me that God is unknown and unknowable, that he has inconsistent characteristics predicated on their religious writings, and in addition to that, their deity is such that it is, in a sense, disassociated from whatever its creation is to it, then, then those are the defining traits. I don't create an epistemology for myself in the sense that I'm not saying, well, let me look at what the church fathers are because I'm presupposing that what the church fathers are saying means anything other than just a series of opinions formulated by the church fathers. Now, I think it's evidence of certain things. So there are several books that have been written about, by Latter-day Saints on a scholarly level with regards to supporting the apostasy. One of them is, and I've got, I've got to sit in here. It's a pretty short book. Have you ever read The Great Apostasy by James Talmadge? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. I could, in a sense, I could sit and just read this to your audience, and it's the entire argument that we've made. And that's one of the reasons I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and quote scriptures and things. They're here. Go read the book. That's our position. That's the official position of the church, in a sense. But the reality of it is, is it doesn't matter where the hill of beans, because once I've decided that, for example, Allah, Allah has power absolutely to forgive sin, to forgive the wrongs. Islam is a works-based religious system where people, you know, the good and the bad outweigh each other and, and Allah chooses to forgive and absolve people of the wrongs. And then whatever happens to them in the afterlife is what Allah decides, right? And to a sense, generally speaking, that's, that's the faith the tradition altogether. Now, what do they have to do to do good works? Those are the systematic theology that's found within the faith tradition. Those are that their good works are. I don't believe in a works-based system, despite what your what your what your uh, listeners might think. Mormonism is not a works-based system of theology. I don't believe orthodoxy is either. Do you? Um, we believe that works are important, but certainly, you know, works alone are not going to save you. Yeah. No. Right. And I think that let me let me make a statement. This is Mormonism in a nutshell. We are saved by grace after all that we can do, found in uh, 2 Nephi 25.3. People often throw that, that verse at us to say, you guys believe that after all you can do, and then we're questioned with, well, did you do all that you can do? And Mormons wanting to be somewhat critical of their own activities try to say, well, did I? Did I do all that I can do? And the reality of it is, is you did, because all you can ever do is what you did. 
your capacity to act is limited by the context in which you act. It's limited by your knowledge, your understanding, your experience, your strengths, your weaknesses, and all the other vicissitudes of life that are imposed upon you at the time you act. We can always, in hindsight, go back and say, I could have lifted more weight at the gym. I could have ran an extra mile on that, on that leg of that journey. But the reality of it is, is in the moment, you didn't. All you did is what you can do. And the reality of it is, is in that text, in its, in its chapter of heading, all we can do is accept and rely on Christ with our faith. That's all we can do. And that's all there is to do. And so in that sense, what we do is as we learn and our capacity increases, we act and we increase more and we improve. But those are all consequences of the grace that we receive by virtue of our faith in Christ. Now, do, what does that sound like? That probably sounds very similar to your own faith tradition. And most evangelicals are sitting here watching and saying, that's what I believe. And that's not what Mormons believe. Well, I've only ever been a Mormon and that's what I believe. And that's what I've been taught. So that's the faith tradition that I follow. So in, in context of an apostasy, the problem with that is, is that in looking at the traditions in the faith, certainly with respect to your argument, there, there are always going to be those who understand and adhere to those defined principles. And with respect to looking at other faith traditions, it's those beliefs that help me to identify Christianity as it's understood is the faith tradition that to me is more consistent with all the other facilities that I have. They're consistent with my understanding, my logic, my education, my experience, my knowledge. Islam is not. It's just simply not. It doesn't, doesn't melge. It doesn't merge. It doesn't fit. But does that mean it's not incompatible with somebody else? No. And does that mean it's wrong for them to be Muslim? No. And as a Latter-day Saint, I can grant them the grace to continue to be a Muslim and know that they're not going to hell when they die because my theology teaches me that. Make sense? Yeah. And, you know, like you said, there's a lot in there that I think we share. Um, you know, we also, the Orthodox, get flack from Protestants, uh, accusations of being work-based because we put such a strong emphasis on the very healing uh, sacraments or mysteries. Right. Um, we see these things as important. As St. Paul tells us, we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And to that, I would say, too, it's important or noteworthy to note that the word used for to, to be saved, salvation in the New Testament, almost exclusively, like overwhelmingly, is used in the future tense. Will be saved, can be saved, will be saved. It's something looking forward to the future. So we don't accept once saved, always saved. Right. And that's another uh, rubbing point. Um, and well, then touching. Uh, and then to, just to wrap up a, a response on that, kind of touching on what you were saying earlier, like I said near the end of my debate with Robert, um, I am very, I, I don't like to play the game of you're going to hell. Um, that's not 100% not on my shoulders to say or determine. Um, let, let, well, let, and, let, go ahead and finish, and then I want yeah. to ask you about that, because that's an interesting perspective. Okay, well, because, you know, uh, I, I also said I don't think that um, people who don't have a understanding of the Trinity uh, are going to hell, uh, that there's nowhere in Scripture that says if you don't have a correct understanding of who God is and all of that kind of thing, you're going to hell. And I cite uh, Romans 10, 9, you know, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, and so I, I also going back to Logos Spermaticos, which I brought up earlier, if somebody is a good person and they are Muslim, atheist, Hindu, LDS, uh, Methodist, far be it from me to even think that a good person who did his or her best is going to hell simply because they weren't in communion with the one true holy Catholic and apostolic faith. Um, we believe in prayers for the dead. We pray for the dead. Um, and so we, we don't rule out totally the idea that people can be saved after death. 
Well, let me let me ask you this, and that's that's what I'm asking you is so. What what is the belief therein? So if I if I reject fully orthodoxy after fully and completely understanding it, um, you know most most evangelicals and Protestants would say, you know, if you you've had an opportunity to hear the pleasing word of God and accept Christ as your personal savior and did not, then certainly you're going to hell. And I think that that's one of the reasons why, at least from an LDS and perhaps an Orthodox perspective, the acceptance of Christ is such a simplistic act. I think that, that that's, that's, a, that's to some degree a straw man. And those who are watching, I don't intend to do that. I fully and, and, and completely understand what the actual complexities of being saved actually are. I understand the interplay between works and grace and faith and how they're received in the in the evangelical and, or, and Protestant traditions, but the reality of it is is that I, I I don't differ that much with Protestants and they they believe that we do, but with respect to that, so if I am not well, for example, the Orthodox Church baptizes infants, correct? If somebody dies and doesn't receive baptism, what happens? If somebody, you're saying if a, a baby dies before if being baptized? Yeah. If, if, it, if somebody in the Orthodox, I join the Orthodox faith or I start communion with the Orthodox faith and die before I receive a baptism, does a baptism from another faith tradition operate to, to satisfy that requirement? Ah. Does, does the cleric have to do it? And if an infant dies at six months old and the parents never got around to getting him baptized, how does that affect them? Well, I know that we do not believe that unbaptized infants <laughs> go to hell. <laughs> um, regarding people, though, um, it, it's an interesting question because I've seen this is where another one of those things where it's like if somebody in the comments wants to correct me, I'm open to that. But my understanding is that infants absolutely will not go to hell. Um, that's that's patently ridiculous. And people who were not baptized. Um, you know, we, we look at the thief on the cross. It's, it's his confession, his belief that saved him. And so, yes, like, you know, if, if there's a sincere deathbed confession from a murderer. Well, let me, I don't, let me ask I, you this with respect, just because you brought up, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, you're just, fine. So I don't, I don't miss it. How do you know the thief on the cross wasn't baptized? I don't know. <laughs> it's never I, stated I in scripture. That. And uh, I would the only thing that because he was probably probably based on the on the context and the reason he was being crucified along with Christ. I mean, we often understand that he was a thief, but he probably was not. He was probably a traitor to Rome. He was probably fighting to explicate the, the, the Jews from Roman rule and was seen as a traitor the same way Jesus was for announcing himself as a sovereign. And so it wasn't like they just took ordinary guys who stole bread and stuff and crucified them. With that respect, you're talking about a very devoted Jew. And the reason likely predicated on that context that he laughed or mocked on knocked Jesus was because the two men knew that Jesus wasn't part of their number. He knew that they knew he wasn't one of them. And here he is getting crucified. Now, it doesn't mean that that group didn't accept the baptism of John or the other apostles. No. And so... I, I, the understanding that he was not baptized is just a, a superimposition on the text. It's just not supported there. And that, that's, that's where I'm a lot. I just read the words for what they are. Makes sense. I don't try to draw a conclusion one way or the other. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. Um, you know, the thief on the cross is identified as the thief on the cross. Christ is uh, mockingly referred to as the king of the Jews. Um, they don't, seem to hide or obfuscate what Christ is guilty of in their eyes. And so I, I think it would be reading into the text to try to, you know, say that he was not actually a thief. I'm not aware of any uh, patristic writings or commentaries that argues that he wasn't a thief on the cross. Well, from uh, the historical, a it's a historical argument. It's, it's not, it's not going to be in a religious setting. The historical position is, is that um, looking from looking at the text from a, a, a purely historical setting, um, crucifixion was reserved for people who were tried for treason, like Jesus was. And and that's where that's where again I don't have to worry about trying to keep the text separate from a historical rendering that some of the events recorded therein are nonsense. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I would be with you on that particular point. Right. But, but how does, so if the thief, if the thief could receive salvation absent baptism, then an orthodox position regarding baptism being of necessity, then, then I, I don't know, maybe is that the orthodox position that, that he was not baptized and died and without baptism? Because that's something that if you don't know that, that's something that the church must have some view on that, I would imagine. I'm actually not aware of anything that talks about the thief being baptized. So I, I have to plead ignorance on that one. Yeah, so you, as you may be aware, we use that occurrence. And, and granted, I, I think that there's some differences between it because there's two accounts of the thief on the cross and one of them were both mock him and one of them where one of them is repentant. I don't believe there's any way to reconcile the two accounts. One of them occurred and one of them did not and you can take your pick. But for purposes of the penitent thief on the cross, um, looking to Christ and, and trying to defend him against the other and saying he's innocent, etc. cetera, um, we, our, our understanding is people don't go to heaven or hell immediately after death. Our theology is developed in that way. And so we have, we have an understanding of the spirit world that is consistent with what Jewish and Hebrew literature would support. There's some kind of a spirit world, an intermediary. It's demonstrated in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that they're not necessarily in hell. It's demonstrated in First Peter that there's this, there's this disposition. I, do you guys, do you Orthodox believe in a purgatory? Uh, we do not accept purgatory. However, we do have a firm theology on um, a particular judgment that happens after death. And that is basically uh, a sorting hat that, you know, where the path that you set on with this life is going to inform the path that you continue on in the next life. It's going to inform where you reside, so to speak. So, the particular judgment uh, for an unrepentant murderer, it's probably going to be an unpleasant experience. But for somebody who did his or her darndest, it's probably going to be a relatively pleasant experience. So after the particular judgment, we believe that there will come eventually, I presume after the second coming, a final judgment. And that is where the more enduring uh, state of affairs will be decided. Well, and that's, and that's another, that's another issue that, that, I, that we're going to have to, um, we can discuss briefly that, that for me, what you just indicated is a changing of the ordinances. So that would constitute apostasy from the original church, if that's what you're going to do. So if you're going to go back to the New Testament manuscripts and point to some kind of an authoritative text or source, or even later ecumenical councils or, or, um, groups and discussions that, that would decide whatever based on the ecclesia. So if you've got that, the problem with it is, is that do you believe that Christ commanded all men to repent and be baptized in water? Yes. Okay. So how do you reconcile that with those who cannot receive that, that uh, saving sacrament? We see baptism as something that's very important. It's a saving mystery. Um, but to say that God cannot accomplish his will without this particular ritual, I think is uh, personally ludicrous. I think that these uh, rituals, these mysteries are here for us. And it isn't to say that God is bound by them. So God is ultimately going to save who he wills. Um, God was speaking to people in that time who had the option of doing so. I understand where you're coming from with uh, baptisms for the dead. And, uh, you know, I, I, I respect where you're coming from on that, if that's that's what you're alluding to. But, yeah, we... we... Well, not necessarily to that, but, but yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Because what I'm, what I'm actually getting at is what you just stated. He saves whom he wills. How is that any different than any other... I mean, you see what that does, though, John, take into its logical conclusion, if God saves who he wills, independent of any kind of commandment or assertion or, or principle that is applied to humans to do certain things or acts or whatever the case may be, um, I, I'm going to have I'm going to switch. Hold on a second.
I'm, I'm looking this way. It's because this, the monitor that I was on is, is going out. So I've, I've just switched it to this. So you'll have to look at the side of my face. No but sweat. The reality of it is, is that in looking at, um, in looking at those, that's going to be horrible. In looking at those, those principles, um, if God can save whom he wills, if that's actually, and I don't know, again, I don't know if that's John Yelland or if that's the position of the Orthodox faith in order to reconcile that. You see, what you've had to do is you've taken a, a, a concrete doctrine and you've softened it or changed it in order to accommodate an exception. Well, if there's the exception, why can't the exception be the rule? Right? Yeah. And to that extent, I would say, um, as I said, these, these sacraments, these mysteries are saving and they are crucial. They're, they're so helpful to salvation. We view the church as a hospital, a hospital where the sick come to get well. And so we view, you, you could think of these, these mysteries, these sacraments as being sort of divine medicine. Now, like I said, um, we, I, I think it doesn't work to rule out God's providence in this regard. Um, you you said you, you don't by, know. What, what do you mean by that? Is that what you're talking about where he can save whom he wills? Yes, precisely. I'm not aware of any uh, expression in an ecumenical uh, council or any doctrine that talks about this. I am aware of the question of universalism. Mm -hmm. Actually, this might be a good way to go because we we had a a debate. I think it was in the 700s over universalism. Universalism right. is basically the idea that eventually everybody will be saved. And we ended up deciding or or concluding rather that while we hope that everybody can eventually be saved. We cannot say for certain because salvation is ultimately a relational, uh, a relational thing. God can't force you to love him. God can't force you to enter into a relationship with him. So out of respect for uh, Hitler or Mao or Stalin, uh, <laughs> to use the most extreme examples, God is going to respect your free will. And, uh, you know, it. this is something that I think was stated by C.S. Lewis, but I've heard it uh, mentioned numerous times uh, in homilies from my own church, but the gates of hell are barred from the inside. So uh, I, I don't know exactly where and how baptism figures into that, but I, I would say that this is a mixture of what I'm saying versus the Orthodox Church. And like you said before, um, you know, you are not an official representation of the LDS church. I'm not an official representative of the no, Orthodox and I, church. And I think it's more important for purposes of this discussion to recognize that. So when I talk to people, I mean, obviously, as a very missionary-minded faith tradition, you know, we have our little missionaries running around all the time. My intention with anybody is to try to help them to understand my theology well enough that they can hurt. But the reality of it is, is I understand that that's, that's case by case. But I'm not trying to appeal to the Orthodox Church. I'm appealing to what John Yellen knows. I don't. Sure. I don't really give two craps about what the Orthodox Church teaches officially, because John, if I want to know that, I've got the Orthodox Church of America website, and it's very, very comprehensive. It's got a lot of good stuff on there, and so I don't need to ask John what a lot of that stuff is. I can ask you how you understand it, but that's all you can tell me. And so it's the same thing. Now, now Latter Day Saint theology is a little bit different, though because we have official positions and, and things that are found on our website, which you can find, but how the individual members understand them is very, very wide and diverse because of the nature of our church. But here's, here's my issue. Going back to the baptism thing, and I'm going to harp on it a little bit because it's a, it is, to me, and again, it's a chink in the armor of, of your claim that you were not found in apostasy because you've got, you've got clear evidence in the new testament that they were performing baptisms for the dead what is your position on that now you understand that the lds position on that is that those who don't receive baptism and have an opportunity 
are afforded that after death by virtue of the sacrament being performed in the temple vicariously. And we, we do that based on the principle of vicarious proxy. Jesus was a vicarious proxy. And by virtue of his proxy, he opened up the possibility for us to act as saviors on Mount Zion and participate in that saving work with him. And by doing that, we are also engaged in a redemptive process for our own selves. Now, so, but the, 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 the text actually indicates they were doing baptism for the dead. So why doesn't the Orthodox Church there gap that, gap that problem by saying, you know what, we're going to start doing baptism for the dead like the Latter-day Saints do? Um, <clears throat> that's a very good question. And I would say the text itself is actually fairly ambiguous. He refers to they perform baptisms for the dead, not we. And the topic of concern was actually not necessarily baptism, but resurrection. And so the, the other thing I would point to is, as far as I understand, there's like nothing in the post-apostolic church that indicates uh, that this was a orthodox, in the lowercase o, practice. Uh, you have minor sects like the Ebionites, if I recall right, who practiced it, but this is something that was uh, determined to be unorthodox fairly early on. I think it was the Synod of Hippo, but yeah, I, I think that pretty much rules it out. No, and, and see, and I, I, I would have to disagree because here's the argument I've, I've heard. Tell me if, you, if this is how you've understood it as well. The Paul, in trying to reiterate the reality of a physical resurrection, which does the Orthodox Church believe in a physical bodily resurrection for those who are saved? Yes, for okay. a general resurrection, to be sure. Okay. Yeah, we, we are reconstituted in some way with a body that is physical and tangible, flesh and bone like Jesus' body was in Luke 24, right? Okay, so on that we would agree. Now, to, to my understanding, and this is where I, what I would say, is that is about as clear and unambiguous a statement as could ever be uttered ever in the history of the world, that Jesus of Nazareth resurrected and showed a physical body of flesh and bone to his apostles. There's no indication anywhere that he died. In fact, that's what Paul's trying to teach against, that he lost that body, that he's no longer physical, that he doesn't have his flesh and bone, right? And some of that is what's spilling over to the Corinthians because they're arguing that there's not really a physical resurrection. And he goes through this big argument, um, really good rhetoric that he's trying to get that. So my question is, is that when, when would Paul and why would Paul have said, else what shall they, those guys who are doing something that we don't believe and agree with, else what shall they, those guys doing the corrupt practice that's not orthodox, do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all why are they those corrupt unorthodox apostates why are they baptizing for the dead yeah i don't know i haven't uh, looked into this topic as much as you have <laughs> well, and, and, and well the reason is is obviously because it's part of my theology and so for me for me i've got the the understanding that there's a practice being done and they and, and the and we and those kinds of semantics is what a lot of people point to most people i, I don't know if you know who uh i hate to even say his name but the carm website christian apologetic uh, church ministry oh uh, yeah He's, i can't remember what his name is off the top of my head uh, matt I slick i was gonna say don't mention it that but, character yeah that, so that hooligan yeah he's he's pretty good at ellipses and creatively editing comments out of context, especially with the church fathers. But in the sense that in the sense that what his argument is, is like you, like you indicated, I think he actually used the even Ebionites. Now their practice of baptism for the dead was something like baptizing corpses in the ocean, right? So here Paul is trying to teach the correct principle of bodily resurrection. And in order to reiterate that principle as a as an example of basically a nonsensical practice of why are people being baptized for the dead? If the dead don't rise, why are they baptized for the dead? But he's referring to an apostate group. Well, the response to that actual question would thereafter be, well, they're baptizing for the dead because they're idiots. They're, they're apostates. So that doesn't support your argument, Paul. I mean, that's like you trying to argue that, that 
why why does the orthodox church do a particular practice and the people who are disputing with that practice or belief and you point to well the lutherans do it and they'd say well so they're apostates they're not with us so why would you try to reiterate the efficacy or reality of that doctrine by pointing to a group that is obviously an error you see what i mean so the, in the context it makes no sense that paul and so i always ask people go find me another time where paul makes an argument like that and points to some apostate groups practices to reiterate the reality of his own belief system and i i, I haven't found one because i mean that would mean paul's pretty poor at making argumentation especially in a letter right because when we write things out we should be a little bit more careful what we're writing yeah <laughs> so but but I, I don't know what your feeling on that is and that's something that that so for me like you, you you had mentioned well how do you know islam isn't true well i believe that in order for there to be for the same reason i reject the trinity i believe in order for the sacrifice of jesus christ and the reality of human life and existence here on this planet to make sense there has to be a father god who is a pronouncer of law and a requirement of activity and obedience a failure on the part of the children to perform and an intercessor in the in the in between to reconcile the two without that intercessor the fact that god in his incorporeal incomprehensible nature actually serves the function to reconcile man to himself is no different to me than islam because god can just do what he wants you've indicated that with baptism if god can forgive that particular commandment and not require obedience to it if indeed it's a commandment which is why luther uh, um, protestants and other evangelicals don't believe it is they don't think that you have to do water baptism in many cases and so it, it's a it's an outward expression of an inward commitment so with respect to those particular things you're defining a god that's no different than the god of islam that can just do whatever he wants if he wants to save people he can save them if he wants to forgive them he can forgive them if he wants to give them a, a clemency or a dispensation from perform, performing a particular act he can do it i believe that god when he speaks he expects to be obeyed and if there's not an obedience on the part of this person, there has to be an intermediary that alters the dynamic or the covenant so that it can be obeyed by changing the terms of the original agreement. And if you've ever watched uh, uh, Boyd K. Packer's got a great little analogy he does called the, the a mediator. And so in respect to that, he explains why you'd have to have a lawgiver and a mediator in between God and man. Yeah, and I, I don't see how that differs, at least on a surface level, from the mainstream or traditional or certainly orthodox conception. Well, it, well, and, and, and I think that that's because, um, so, and, and, I'll, and I'll do this. So, um, one of the, uh, if I can get this to come up, hold on, my screens are failing me. So, John 17, 3. So John 17 is the intercessory prayer, right? So you don't need much more context than that, I would imagine. Speaking to his apostles, right? The setting is that. And he states, he states in three, he says, and this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What do you think it means to, 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 to know God in that context? What is he talking about? To act in a synergistic way with god shooting from the hip i don't know you might have a different answer but i don't have the text in front of me but i would assume it has something to do with synergizing with god to okay. to be christ-like right and so i i don't i don't really have any limit language on that i believe it's to know god to know god's character to know god's what god is christ seems to be a prototype of god would you agree with that 100 percent and so Christ is the prototype of God is trying to reveal the father to humans. And I think that he that's that's demonstrated very clearly in the resurrection account in Luke 24, where he says, don't be afraid, don't be scared. This this is what it is. This is what God is. I'm God and here I am. 
don't be afraid. I've got fingers, I've got toes, I've got eyes and ears and a mouth. Handle me and see, oh, and by the way, I'm hungry and I can eat. My body actually can function. Now, am I saying that God is a human? No. And I think that that's one of the things Robert kept saying in the, in the, it was like nails on the chalkboard for me. We're not saying God is a human. God is not an exalted human. God is God. And he is divinity, whatever that constitutes. And but he, they, I, sorry, go, go on. No, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. Okay. So with <laughs> respect to that, I believe that, but then I looked at the Orthodox Church of America's website, which I'm not going to hold you to it, but that's what it says on the website. It says, according to the Orthodox teaching, God is always and forever unknowable and incomprehensible to creatures. In his essence, yes. And in God the, referring to the Father. Right. In the in even in the eternal life of the kingdom of God, heaven, as we say. Men will never know the essence of God, that is, what God really is in himself. I don't know what that means. So, I mean, God is immaterial, and how can you know mathematics, for example? Um, math mathematics, I mean, you, you may disagree as to whether or not mathematics are actual abstract objects as opposed to concrete objects, but it's like, how do you know mathematics by participation in mathematics? How do you know a mind by engaging with another mind? Um, I'm kind of clumsy with the way that I'm approaching this, but no, no, no. You know, it, well, well, and I'll tell you, John, you're going to have to be because that doesn't make any sense. I think it makes perfect sense. No, no, no. I, I think that you, well, and, and again, I, I'm not going to impose my belief on you, but in my estimation, when I hear people try to explain something like that, I think that they're convincing themselves it can make sense. It's actually not supposed to. The Trinity is a mystery. The triune God is a mystery, right? Flat out. It's contradictory. In fact, I was talking, you know who uh, Robert Bowman is? Uh, Robert Boylan, I think? Bowman. Is that the uh, LDS blogger? No, Robert Bowman is an evangelical who runs um, the Institute for Religious Research. Oh. He, he, he shut it down. Anyway, he's a He's a common, what we would call an anti-Mormon antagonist. Oh, I've probably uh, run into his work before, but he writes I've... he writes prolifically on LDS topics, even though he's never been a member, which I think is funny. Um, but but reality of it is, is one of the things that he said to me is he says that there's no, they're not contradictions, not at all. They're um, I can't remember the word now that he uses, but they're not they're not contradictions. They're they're uh, um, I have to find it, the actual word that he used. It was funny. But I, I thought it basically means the same thing. I'm like, that's just a synonym for contradictions. He says, they're not contradictions, they're mysteries or whatever the case may be. And I said, okay, that's fine. But for me, as a Latter-day Saint, looking at the scriptures, what you're trying to do is you're trying to define God in a way, or at least your church is, in a way that is, that is unknown and unknowable. But when I read John 17, 3, without any kind of, let's say I don't have any erudition in my brain, I don't understand things, I've not read much, and I see that life eternal is to know God and Jesus Christ, both, and all of a sudden I read that according to the Orthodox teaching, he's unknowable and incomprehensible, I have to kind of raise an eyebrow. And it reminds me of a talk that was given by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. Um, in, in talking about some of the distinctions between our own faith tradition and those of other Christian faiths, he says, woe is me, they have taken my God away from me, and I know not whom to adore or to address. And that's quoted from Owen Chadwick in his book, Western Asceticism. And so the issue with that is, is that that's what I relate to. That's what I'm seeing. When I look at other faith traditions, I'm looking at a deity that is unknown and unknowable, when the clear language that I see in the New Testament is Christ trying to help humans to understand their father and their God. And he is doing that using his himself as the reference point. Yes. See, and yes, I mean, you know, Christ you're says... Saying, you're saying that that doesn't work that way, that it's not literal, it's more figurative, right? Well, I mean, I, I think we need to examine the whole of Scripture. I mean, Christ says, they, they ask Christ, show us the Father. He says, why do you ask me that? I've, I'm still here, and you're asking me that? 
if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I believe it's Hebrews that says that Christ is the perfect uh, representation of the Father's uh, hypostaseos, which is the the, Godhead bodily is how it's phrased, right? So so he, he is the perfect representation of God's essence. And so we see constantly throughout scripture as well, you cannot see the face of God and live. And yet people constantly see, you know, throughout scripture, they see God and they're like, how, how have I not died? The, uh, the early church fathers, you know, explain this as the theology of theophanies, that these were theophanies. So everything is coherent yeah, and in line not, with scripture. What do you mean by theophanies? Are you talking about a, like a, because as I understand that term, that's like a, a reflection, right? Uh, Some a theophany would be a pre-incarnation appearance of God. You have uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel, and then he says, oh, I have wrestled with God. You have uh, the angel visiting, I think it was Abraham, uh, with two other, you have God visiting Abraham with two other angels, and then he calls down uh, fire from the skies from Yahweh. These are what we call theophanies. They're a post in pre-incarnation appearances of the deity and so yeah and so with respect to the to a universal apostasy um we both agree that um our faith tradition we, we would in, we would independently agree our own faith tradition is the true church or whatever you want to believe or think it is it's god's church and we both would argue that. And we would also argue that everybody else is in apostasy, correct? Sure. Okay. So now it's just you and I arguing whether or not you're in apostasy. <laughs> right? No, seriously, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Now, you, your, your claim that I'm in apostasy, that's fine. I, I, I could be apostate, right? But the reality of it is, is you're claiming that your church has survived throughout all of time and history. But I'm saying that you've got a problem when it comes to the ordinance of baptism. You're saying in one respect that it's a universally, it's a universal commandment, I suppose, that all people everywhere should repent and be baptized. To the best of their ability, yes. Right. And that's and that's where I would say no, there's not to the best of your ability. We all must be baptized. It's an unequivocal commandment. You have See, to be baptized. And, 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 the, and the New Testament manuscripts provide a way. And you're saying, well, it's not understood. Okay, that's why we need additional revelation on the subject. I don't think it is provided in Scripture. Like we, uh, we pointed out in 1 Corinthians, I think it is, it's ambiguous. Paul says they. And no, I know no. we've already gone over this, but there's nowhere in Scripture. Like the New Testament isn't generally um, a systematic theology. No, so it's not, not going to right. find you're not going to find a outline of the of how to perform baptism for the dead. You never see baptism for the dead commanded, explained, um, described, uh, the importance of it described. And when you go into the early church fathers, the post apostolic church fathers, you don't find that this is a, a widely accepted or even common practice either. And so you may appeal to mystery, say, well, you know, uh, um, you know, the apostasy had already happened by then. But I think we run into a whole litany of issues when we try to throw the apostles in Christ into the basket of being, uh, you know, ineffective or liars. No, and, I, and I'm not saying, and I, I see, I don't know why that, that claim came up. We are not claiming that anybody is ineffective or liars. I, I don't understand that. That's something that's often imposed. And you're saying... I do not believe everybody apostatized because my understanding of apostasy is simply that the apostolic authority that was given to those 12 men and appears to have continued by the calling of other apostles to constitute a quorum stopped. The second aspect of it is you've got evidence of that in the closure of a scriptural canon. Then you've got a problem in the sense that you actually hit it right on the head, John. You're saying the apostles didn't write a systematic theology. It's actually a joke in the church that when we sit in our quorums and councils and meetings, we laugh whenever we come up with these kinds of subjects that do you think Paul was, when he wrote his letter to the Romans or the Corinthians, 
that he understood that he was writing the Bible. And if he understood that that's what he was going to be doing, don't you think he'd have taken a little bit more care to provide more background? Now, what he did do, and as we're seeing with Corinthians specifically on that one point, is that he speaks about baptism for the dead, but provides no context. He provides no other direction. And you're saying because of that, with a wave of the hand, you just dismiss the verse. And I'm saying, no, we better figure out what the hell that means. And I'm saying in the context of several other passages, the, the thief on the cross, the spirit world, where we go after death, do we go to heaven or hell? Is there a, is there a place for people who, who were good people but didn't quite get an opportunity to accept the gospel? All these big questions that are being asked of Christians, they just wave their hand and say, ah, God will figure it out. And he hasn't revealed it. And what I'm saying is I believe that the LDS church is correct and true because through revelation, specific guidance has been given so we can go back into scripture and understand what the hell was going on back then. It's not authoritative in the sense that we don't have to match tit for tat what's going on. God, if he wants there to be 11 to 70 apostles, can certainly do that. But as it sits right now, we don't. We have 12. And that's what he wants to continue to do. We also have a quorum called 70. The apostles called 70. The 70 were sent out. We have the same constitution there as well. So the idea is, is that we're trying to replicate the church, but we're not going back to the New Testament to do it. We are, we are replicating it because we believe a prophet received direction to replicate it. And that's, that's the understanding of, of, of what we believe Joseph Smith did. So in reference to doing that, the question of, is the commandment to be baptized absolute? We believe that it is. We believe that Christ's words to Nicodemus regarding, um, do you have to be born again of water and the spirit? We believe that that was an absolute, that all men everywhere need to be baptized. But your church tradition is saying no, because it can't happen because we don't know. And so what we're going to do is God has grace. God can do what he wants. But that's no different to me than looking at the at Muslims at, at a deity that can effectively do whatever he wants. He's absolutely sovereign. That's no different than a Calvinist saying God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. Commandments don't matter. Obedience doesn't matter. God can save you if he wants to. And I, I just, I, I can't, I can't make that rational in my brain, if that makes sense. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, I, I think it's been uh, revealing or, or interesting because, you know, like you said, you, you don't think the LDS church is in alignment with the New Testament church. You know, you have a presidency and the two counselors and 12 apostles, uh, and that isn't found in scripture. There's no prophet in the new testament church there's no counselors wait, wait, you wait, can wait, appeal wait, 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 i let you talk i let you talk please let me please let me just get back right. on this so you you have a discontinuity with the new testament church and i understand your position but kind of like with the thief on the cross you're having to appeal to mystery you're having to say well we don't know that he wasn't baptized and i'm saying there's no evidence that he was baptized there's no reason to think that he was baptized um you talk about uh, Revelation providing a roadmap for understanding scripture. It's like, okay, well, we, we have the same position, essentially, because for us, the church is under the wings of the Holy Spirit. It's under the guidance of the apostles and Christ himself. So we look at the scripture and the ecumenical council through this lens of, you might say revelation, you might say uh, divine guidance, but we don't believe that Christ ever abandoned the church. We believe that he and the saints are still active and working in the church. Um, and, you know, regarding the quorum of the 70, and I, I don't know your position on this, it might be the same as with uh, the, the, the prophet counselors and that kind of thing, but it's like similar. The, the 12 apostles never made any effort to preserve the an enduring continuing body of 12 apostles. Similarly, they called 70, but they didn't ever make any uh, attempt to preserve the 70. A lot of the 70, in fact, went on to be bishops in their own respective uh, areas. Um, and I, I think we're, I'm seeing a lot of similarities with uh, how the Muslims justify their beliefs because they, 
they are essentially picking and choosing what they want out of scripture to justify their own presuppositions. And you'll say that I'm doing the same thing, but I'm saying we have more of a comprehensive uh, and wholesome uh, defense because we have not only scripture, we have the early church fathers, we have the ecumenical councils, we have saints, we have active miracles. We are the true embodiment. We are the true church of Jesus Christ of ancient and modern day saints. And see, and, that, and, and let me let me speak. And the reason I was I was, and I apologize for trying to interrupt you, but oh, you're fine. The reality of it is, is that you you misrepresented what I said. I did not say there was not a prophet. I indicated that we are not certain who it was. I did not indicate that there. I mean, I, I you, you said something else, and I don't remember what it is. But that's the problem. You you misrepresented what I said. You also indicated again for the third time. I do not believe, and our church does not maintain, that the apostles lied or failed, or that Christ abandoned his church. What you're doing, John, is you're presupposing that human beings can't do what they want based on their own understanding, particularly in the light of a rejection of an authoritative apostle or prophet telling them specifically what god wants them to do and that doesn't exist and it did not maintain it's not a continuity the other issue is what i'm saying is is the loss of specific answers to questions raised by the text now i'll tell you this you you mentioned we 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 just pick and choose we don't we don't pick and choose not one thing that i believe is inconsistent or not compatible with the biblical text nothing what you're doing though is you're reading the text like a lot of evangelicals and other christians do in the sense that you're trying to mishmash them together and not understand what they actually are the hebrew texts are the hebrew texts the greek texts are the greek texts going back to isaiah and deuteronomy to the to the shema and those kinds of things to try to impose monotheism on early christians who are burdened with the problem of a revelation of two deities and try to say, no, no, homoousis or some other principle is applied to reconcile that back to monotheism. That's what we do because we have to have scripture make sense. What I'm saying is I am agreeing with what scripture's message is, which is we learn line upon line, precept upon precept, more revelation means more understanding you don't go back to revelation or or uh the pauline epistles and and reinterpret judaism in light of first century second century greek texts allegedly written by early christians you don't do that and god doesn't expect you to because that's not a systematized theology you said so yourself but you're pretending that it is it's not a systematized theology. All you get is just baptisms for the dead. What does it mean? I don't know. Ignore it. That's what you're doing. You're saying, well, let's just ignore that. Oh, God's a trinity. Why? Well, because the Old Testament says there's only one God, even though ancient Jews practiced henotheism and monolatry. They didn't practice monotheism until later. And actually, Jesus is here preaching to apostates and telling them they're in apostasy. And so the idea of a revelation building is the only, the only message that we can find in scripture. Latter-day Saints just say, and that continued. That's what breaks us out of universal apostasy. We don't have to go back with a magnifying glass and find everything in the texts of those 66 texts that somebody decided were scripture or however else you've modified the canon. That's not how that works. And, and the idea of, of prophetic succession revelation, we can say, no, tell me that it didn't occur. You're saying that there's no evidence of a prophetic succession. Now, how do you understand Matthias's calling then? Um, as it's stated, they actually state in the text, they do that in order to fulfill prophecy. Right, and what prophecy are they referring to? What are you talking about? Oh, man, I, I can't name it off the top of my head, but I believe it's a prophecy in Psalms, and it refers to this exact position that they found themselves in. So therefore, they replaced Judas in order to fulfill scripture 
in order okay, to fulfill what, prophecy. Then what is Paul? Paul is a apostle who is called specially by Christ himself. So is he the legitimate apostle or was Matthias? Because some people argue based on what you that argument from Psalms is that that means that means Matthias was not the legitimate apostle because he doesn't meet the criteria. I've and never heard that. I've I've never heard that before. I've heard that um, lots of times. Okay, I I would I would not make any. Uh, I I want to say I wouldn't make any qualitative distinction between Matthias and Paul, but I also, as you mentioned before, I'm aware of many times where Paul says, like, yes, I'm an apostle, but like they are the twelve kind of thing. So. I, I think that he recognized a difference in uh, in respect. In response to some of your things that you said, um, I didn't intentionally misrepresent you. Um, and I, I acknowledge that you don't think that the apostles lied or failed, but I, I, I fail to see how that's not a logical conclusion. Um, well, it can't of, be, it can't, well and, and, and I'll tell you real quick, the reason it's not is because Christianity survived. What you're maintaining, the logical conclusion is that Christianity literally died. And, and that's what you're saying that that so so here look at this way okay the gates of hell will not prevail against it okay that means that what the belief that jesus christ is the son of god and the savior of the world survived the fact that people believe that there needed to be baptism the fact that they read scriptures the fact that they read the words of the ancient apostles that those were to some degree preserved and survived is what led to the restoration of the gospel the gospel was restored, the church was restored and reconstituted. Tell me how Christ lied or the apostles failed. Well, because the church that he established is one that would endure, one that would not fail away. The covenant that he established is one that was better than the old covenant, one that would endure, that would not fall away. And to, to take the position, I think, that the new covenant actually ended up failing, that the the church that Christ built actually was overcome and actually wasn't able to storm the gates of hell is a, I, I, I just see it as an inescapable conclusion that that means the apostles failed and that Christ either failed or is a liar. I, I know, but again, you're, you're doing that by disregarding what I just said. So those principles taught by the apostles survived. The, the church survived Yes. In the sense that Christianity survived and it's valid apostolic priesthood. Well, yes. So do you believe that the that, that Judaism had failed by the time Christ was born? No, I think that Judaism, I mean, just like with uh, the example in First Kings, I think there were plenty of people who were uh, Orthodox in a sense, you know, lowercase o. And I would just point to the immense amount of Jews who ended up accepting Christ. And this gets back to something you were talking about with uh, like henotheism, you know, talking about uh, two powers in heaven. Uh, if you like read the works of Philo, he talks about this, this principle of two powers in heaven. In fact, it was essentially orthodox for the Hebrews that there were two powers in heaven. And Philo talks about the, the, the logos of God in a way that is like, so it's like, he's pointing to Christ. He doesn't know it, but he is. And so a lot of Jews saw Christ as this second power of heaven. And so all that we say is that a lot of people had also too ancient Hebrews. They're like, how is God three, but also one, because there's the Lord and there's the angel of the Lord and there's the, the, the Lord's spirit so this was a discussion that was happening for a long time. In fact, if you read Benjamin Summers' book, Bodies of Heaven, he talks about how it's perfectly coherent because, well, all right, there were plenty of ancient Jewish sects as well who rec recognized a multi-personal God. They recognized that God has multiple uh, personalities, so to speak. I think that's crude um, in its, its way to grapple with the sort of... Uh, multiple hypostases of God. Um, and that's something that I really tried to clarify in my debate with Robert. But the point is, this, this incarnation was a fulfillment. And so I don't think that the Jews were in a state of universal apostasy, then Christ came, established a church, and then almost immediately after he fell, the priesthood and church fell apart. Oh, and and, and 
I, I, I get, I get that, but you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to convey it, but it really seems like because you're so invested in a text-based um, authority that you're, 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 uh, you're able to circumvent logic by going back and just saying, but this guy explained, or this guy said, and that, that is negating the fact that human beings are capable and that we have intelligence and that what we believe and perceive should make sense. And so to, to, to avoid the argument that I'm making, you're changing my argument and you're making it something that it's not in the sense that you're saying, well, you're saying God failed and the apostles lied or, or God, well, the apostles failed and Jesus lied. And you're, you're taking what I stated and, and making it out to me that because the covenant didn't survive and you're acting like death of the church is what occurred with an apostasy. It, 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 I, I don't understand that. We're saying that there was a general falling away, a universal falling away from the principles and precepts that were taught by the apostles. And you're saying what? That we can reconstitute them based on ineffectual texts that are not systematic theology because later smart guys decided what they meant and it was decided on by lots of people. And that was a lot, that was a popular consensus. And so that's the Orthodox faith. So because it was consensus and popular, we can go back and we can reconstruct some of it. But, oh, by the way, if anything's too ambiguous, we just dismiss that and ignore it because it must not have mattered anyway. Oh, and then there's commandments. But if the commandments aren't, are too difficult for us, God can do whatever he wants. Oh, and by the way, um, other things that are not expressed in scripture, which is the source and authority that you're pointing to, not expressed specifically or clearly, and you admitted in the early part of this discussion that the even even the the patristics are subject to interpretation and discontent between them and deciding who does what i'm saying all of that is apostasy and you're just saying no orthodoxy is exempted from that even though we're victims of it and i, I don't get that i just don't i can't i can't wrap my brain around that now we can go into Trinity and all the other specific theological arguments, and you can say, oh, but you know, the Trinity, the triune God, it's found in scripture and blah, blah, blah. In order to do that, you're gonna have to parse together. For example, there's no pre-Nicene church father that acknowledges the triune God as it's understood by Christianity today. It's just, it's just not there. I mean, people well, try to try to hand pick them together, but they just don't exist. And that's a, that's a relatively robust scholarly consensus on the subject. You don't find a systematic theology explaining the Holy Trinity in the way that you might want. Uh, well, no, and, the way that I would need to understand it. Well, which, and so that's, that's where I would say, you know, we have a, an abundance of early church fathers who talk about the Trinity, who talk about the deity of Christ, the deity of the Holy Spirit, the deity of the Father. Um, I tried to emphasize in my debate with Robert the position of strong monarchical Trinitarianism, which right. I think Mormons even would be a little bit more receptive to if they would just let go of the idea that God the Father is a deified human being. I know that you, that. I know that you say you don't believe that, but when let's say on the popular level, it's the only opinion I find in Mormons. And when I look at actual LDS writings, that's what I see reflected. But you see, like, like I, I, I happen to think of this, like, is there any early church father between uh, the, de the death of St. John the Apostle and the Council of the Nicaea? Is there any church father that you would feel comfortable coming into uh, the LDS temple in Salt Lake City at General Conference and delivering a theological like dissertation. And I don't think that you would find, I don't think that you would be able to name any church father who would uh, fit the bill for you. Wait, wait, um, wait, and wait, I'm wait, saying wait. that you're, we you're have- talking about, You're talking about a church father that I would, if they were alive, I would say you can come give a talk. Yeah. Any of them before Nicaea. Okay, great. 
great. So <laughs> then you're going to end up with strong monarchical Trinitarianism, with it, which is an orthodox uh, doctrine. Well, you're going to you're going to think that's what they're teaching, sure. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, this is a whole different debate subject, I guess. I mean, maybe it, it's germane, but um, yeah. I mean, you're. It, it's going to be tough because you know there's there's nowhere in Scripture that you find uh, God the Father being described as. I mean, if not a deified human being, then what? Because God the Father has a body of flesh and bone. He is a body of flesh and bone, correct? I, I don't know what he is. He has one, but he was God before he obtained it. So he's not a, he can't be an exalted human being because LDS theology is that God is eternally God. He did at some point obtain a physical body the same way that Jesus Christ obtained a physical body. But when Jesus Christ was obtaining that body, he was God before God during and God after, the Father would be no different. Why would why would why would the Father be different? Um, so well, all right. Let let's try to parse this out. So, my understanding is that God in the LDS paradigm has not been God from all eternity. He has existed from all eternity, but he has not been God. He became God. He attained to Godhood. No, that's and Robert was wrong on that. Okay, that's could wrong. you could you that's expound weird. on that because. I'm being sincere here. Everything... And, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I am too. I, there, there is nothing that indicates that God became God. Where, okay. What are you I, talking about? I, I'm being sincere when I ask this because I, I, try, I try not to straw man and I try not to misrepresent. And I know that we're kind of missing. Well, no, no. So, well, let me but, ask you this. Well, hold on, hold on. Just the, the last thing. So I, I cannot, everywhere that I've looked on this, I find that God became God that he no. had a father before him no all right Pl can you please explain that because well wh i would have to know what you're talking about to be able to reference that specifically certainly but i i don't know what you're talking about that god became god or that god was not always god the the scriptures for example are are exactly clear that god is god from all eternity to all eternity he's always been god he always will be god the father is the father from eternity is dawn to eternity's end if there is one I, I don't understand where where people think that the king follett sermon certainly doesn't teach any of that kind of nonsense that god wasn't god always god's always been god the well, king follett sermon only says that god obtained a body in the same fashion as his son jesus christ because it's talking specifically about the death of king follett and it's appealing to the principle of the resurrection i i don't understand people who say that we believe God became God. How would he have done that? Let's see. I actually want to pull it up. We have imagined and mm -hmm. supposed that God was God from all eternity. I right. will refute that idea and take away the, and do away with the veil so that you may see. Right. These are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. It is right. the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know and I that... Can, I can quote that to you. What's your point? Well, I want to finish it. Go ahead and finish it. That's fine. I'm just okay. wondering what the point is. Um, here we go. All right. So I, I lost my place. So these are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another and that he was once a man like us. Yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. Right. So God was a man. And like, he says that right. he will refute the idea that God has been God from all eternity. Right. He was a man just like Jesus Christ was. Yeah. So he has not been God for all was eternity. Jesus Christ, was Jesus Christ not God? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. I see what you're doing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything. That's what. Yeah. He yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's, that's a fair point. Um, well, no, that's but, actually the point. Keep reading. Do, 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 that's do, actually do, what do. I wish God I was, was a this. man. God was a man. Now, remember, Joseph Smith is talking to who? People at a funeral. And he's telling him the guy that's dead here is going to rise in the re resurrection. You had supposed that God was God in the sense that he had a physical body of flesh and bone for all eternity. That's not true. God obtained his body in the same way as Jesus Christ. And was, what was Jesus Christ? He was God. 
He was God before he obtained his body. He was God after he obtained his body. He was God when, after he died and was resurrected. That's our theology. Do you think that we don't believe Christ was always God? How did, how did God the Father become a God? He didn't become a God. He's always been God. Okay, so did God the Father have a father? I have no idea. That's not even anything that's been revealed, or where would you find that information? Uh, you see speculation on that from various LDS oh. um, leaders and apostles. Well, people speculate all kinds of stuff. But the apostles are very clear on what what we know and what we don't know. For example, what do families look like in the celestial kingdom? Do we all have thirty wives because of polygamy? Okay. To bring it back to well, apostasy, what's revealed, though, what's the revealed doctrine on that? The revealed doctrine on that is we don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, to bring it back to apostasy, though, um, I can't find anywhere in Scripture that refers to God as having been a man at one point, as having lived on an earth like us. I can't find I, that anywhere in scripture. Right. And that's why you guys are an apostasy. Because How so? Think, because you think everything has to be found in scripture. That's No, problem. that's that's not true. We don't believe that everything has to be found in scripture. I've made that clear since the beginning. And in fact, I stated that's one of the reasons that the Protestants actually attack us. Well, then you should have one of the leaders of your church pray and ask for revelation that can become new scripture for you to explain that principle for you, like we did because we're not in apostasy, because we understand that when we have questions we don't have answers to, we don't have to appeal to a text. We appeal to God. That's the difference between us. I don't have a community or a communal understanding. A prophet asks God, God reveals, and then he reveals it to his people. I mean, that's the principle of revelation is taught in the Bible. That's the only, that's the only consistent principle in the Bible. That's it. And, and that's what I'm saying is that's what my point is. You're saying, well, where does it say in the text? I, it doesn't. What it does say is that Jesus says this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's enough, right? Now, what, what are you saying? Well, you're misinterpreting that. Okay. How do you prove that? You don't. You can't. We can sit and argue in circles that a particular scripture doesn't mean what I think it means. But I don't appeal to scripture in that way. I can go back and say the teachings were found in the ancient church, something like it. I'm not clear, so the prophet needs to inquire from God and find out. That is the principle of the gospel and church. That's the same principle that, that so let me ask you this real quick. So if looking at Matthew 16, it says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Some say you're this, but who do you say? Who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not made it known unto you, but my father is who it is in heaven. And I say you are Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church. What's the rock? There are different interpretations. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. So, but I mean, I, I could make a great case for mine and What's, what's, um, what's yours? I mean, I'd love to hear it. I think it's very interesting because Dr. Michael Heiser, who actually is somebody who Mormons uh, actually quite like, but he makes the case that we have to take into account where this was given. This, uh, this address was given in Caesarea Philippi, and this was sort of a hotbed for, um, for paganism. And so God takes them, or Jesus takes them out of the way to Caesarea Philippi. And what's important also to note is that Caesarea Philippi sits at the feet of these cliffs. And there's a great cave in there where people would go to make sacrifices and to uh, perform idol worship and such. And out of these caves sprang uh, wells or springs, springs came out of these. And they believed that the gods would come in and out of these caves, that the way the gods would come between our world and their world was through this passageway in the cave. And they called the caves the gates of hell. So okay. Jesus, you know, uh, who, who do you say that I am? Uh, the son of God, uh, the Messiah. And he says, great, on this rock, I will establish my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, well, if you take a look at the actual word that's used to derive the term 
uh, shall not prevail against. It's one word and against isn't part of the word. So Dr. Heiser at least uh, argues that if you look at the word in what it actually means and you remove this idea of against, what it more accurately translates to is shall not withstand. And the interesting thing about that is it switches the, the position of what Jesus is saying from defensive to offensive. It's, it's no longer the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. It's that the gates of hell shall not withstand us. And so what does that mean? If Jesus is giving that address in that location, saying these kinds of things, he's saying, I'm building my church in the hotbed of pagan worship, where Baal worship happened, where Greek pagan worship happened. I'm establishing my church in the midst of paganism, false belief, and false belief, paganism, the gates of hell shall not withstand the assault that we are going to do to him. We're going to take the offensive, and I want the church to overcome these false beliefs, this paganism. So um, I, I also, as, as a sort of tack on, would say, um, if, I, if I believe that that is the most correct way to understand the verse, I don't think that rules out uh, other interpretations as being true. Something can be true in a primary sense and in a secondary sense. So we can say, yes, uh, the, I, I believe what I just provided you with, but I think the, uh, the more common understanding, which is that uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against Jesus in his mission to descend into Hades and liberate the souls of all those who had come before him out of Hades and into, um, into the kingdom of heaven, um, I think that's perfectly coherent too. Um, I also think the confession of faith, you know, and that could go back to Romans 10, 9, the confession of faith being the, uh, the rock of the church, I think that's also coherent. And of course, the Catholics will say that um, it was built upon Peter um, because Peter, Petros, uh, rock in Greek, Petros, Petra, um, and, you know, they, they can make an argument for that, but uh, I, I think it's worth noting the many times you see um, Peter not being treated as the Pope would be treated in the modern day, i.e. Uh, infallibility or universal and immediate jurisdiction over the other patriarchs, so... Well, those are developmental things that I think manifest that the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church in apostasy. But no, but, and what I'm saying is, is that the rock, and I, I think that you leaned upon the answer to, to, to some degree, but the rock, what is the rock? I think that there's a lot of, of, of disagreement as to what it is, but in, in our circles, the way we understand it is based on what this text is saying. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says this, Blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not made it re revealed it to you, but my Father is in heaven. And upon this rock will I build my church. The rock is God revealing to man. That's the rock upon which the church would be built. It's the only rock that can form a solid foundation. Relying on human beings to interpret scripture, to develop scripture, to, to correlate scripture, to decide on doctrines or principles is no basis for a rock upon which a church can be built. And so the only rock that forms a foundation that's solid is God speaking to human beings, to revealing to man. And so that's how we understand that. And so the rock of revelation is what was lost at the time that the humans decided that they didn't need re continuing future revelation in the form of guidance for texts that, as you indicated, do not form a systematic theology. If they don't form a systematic theology and the patristic fathers are ambiguous, disagree often with one another and don't form a systematic theology, then the basis of God revealing himself and that being the rock was lost. And that is an apostasy. Now, I loved, I loved that explanation of the rock because that actually, that actually is true because the, 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 the way that the gates of hell did not prevail 
was the fact that Christianity spread because Christianity is very different than other faith traditions because of its missionary setting. Have you, you have you read much about from Bart Ehrman? Um, I have seen a number of debates with him, but I would not really say that like, oh yeah, I'm familiar with Bart Ehrman okay. and his work. Yeah, so I, I, like, I like a lot of, I prefer agnostic mm. scholars to theologians. I don't like theology very much. I've read a lot of it, but the problem I have with theology is theology is opinion-based. So um, for example, my understanding is, is you have a degree in theology. What your degree is necessarily in is um specific ways of viewing the text now does that mean that the, that the degree is not not worthwhile absolutely not it is because you need to understand how various people view the text throughout history according to various faith traditions it's very important and i think it's 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 a, a, a good pursuit but i i would prefer somebody like bart ehrman who simply just reads the text and says this is what's going on i don't give a crap about the trinity or revelation or any of that stuff i don't care what the scripture is i just want to tell you what the texts are because i'm a historian i like aj levine she's a, a she's a jewish scholar of the new testament and i like uh, another one james Tabor and several others but i like them because they don't really believe in god they don't disagree that god exists perhaps but they don't really believe in god so what they're trying to do is give you a very historical and more objective view of what the text is saying so I appreciate what you said. And what was the name of that author that you mentioned? Um, when I was talking about what? The Gates of Hell and his understanding. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser. He's somebody that uh, I've seen Mormons quote a lot. And I yeah, think that's and I, because- And I can understand why, because everything you stated is consistent with our theological premise, because the idea is, is that, is that it, it's actually what I was saying. That's actually, it, it's better words, it's a better way of saying what I was trying to convey. The fact that in a pagan environment that is ruled or controlled by the adversary because it rejects God, it makes God's petty and cruel. And, you know, for example, there's no such thing as blasphemy in the pagan world because, you know, gods were jerks. You could give them the bird and that was that. And if you didn't like this God, you go pray to that one. And that's the way it was. And the whole purpose of worshiping gods was simply to curry favor so they didn't destroy your co crops and kill your kids, right? It wasn't because you're expecting some afterlife. Because for them, everybody went to the same afterlife regardless of what they did. They all went to Hades. Everybody did. So there's not, not some heaven or hell or they don't believe in that dynamic. So with respect to that, there's, there's a good, he makes a good argument because he's saying that we're offensively spreading this gospel and Hades will not stop it. And the gospel spread and was successful. But again, with that argument, what you'd have to concede is the spreading of the gospel, God utilized all of the various philosophies as it spread to utilize the message of Jesus redeeming man from sin, which became a prevailing concept in the ancient world as it spread. Do I believe that that constitutes Hades prevailing? No, the gates of hell don't prevail against that. And that's the problem. People use that scripture to try to say Latter-day Saints think that what? Again, Christianity just lost? No, Christianity proliferated and spread. What we're saying is the actual church, the structure of the church and the rock of revelation died because people rejected it. And that's what the problem was. That's what constitutes the universal apostasy. And, and you yourself have admitted as such with, with, with respect to the, the Orthodox faith. Um, I, I don't know exactly what you're referring to there, but let me just respond to, uh, if, if you put a bookmark in that, then let me catch up to you, so to speak. Sure. Um, so your interpretation of Matthew 16, 18, I see as relying on the same kind of uh, methodologies that you criticize me of utilizing so it's ultimately i mean using your same standard it's just your interpretation and you're just quote mining and you're you know well, doing know. that kind of thing um so I, I think you're in ultimately in the same kind of boat as me if you're going to say like oh no scripture scripture but when i want to prove something of mine then i'm going to use scripture but ignore whatever may support orthodoxy um and then you know you you brought up 
you know, Bart Ehrman and these guys. And it's like, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And to that end, I would say I don't exclusively follow Orthodox theologians. Um, in fact, I got my, uh, I got my theology degree from a Protestant university. And that was an interesting experience. Um, and then using, uh, you, you talked about using other worldviews or basic, I, I think what you were getting at is as, as it spread, Christianity spread into the world, it used other views and other like ways of thinking to communicate Christian truth. And uh, to that, I, I just think of St. Paul, I think it was, who said, you know, to the Jews, I became a Jew, to the Gentiles, I became a Gentile basically saying that like, I'm going to try to identify with everybody to try to bring them to Christ. Um, and, you know, you talk about the, the rock of revelation dying uh, and that being evidence of the church falling into apostasy. Um, you can't even show me where, you know, it's ambiguous. You can't show me where there was a prophet in the new Testament church or in the early church fathers. There's nowhere that refers to a singular prophet. And I know you'll say that's evidence of apostasy, but if it's totally absent, then you have to appeal to mystery or silence. And I don't think that's going to be uh, uh, very kind to you in trying to, you know, make a defense for Mormonism being the original New, Co New Covenant, New Testament church. Um, we have prophecy. Prophecy is still prevalent throughout the Orthodox Church. That's one of the things that testifies to its truthfulness, that we still produce saints. We're a saint factory. We produce relics that actually save and cure. We produce miracles. Um, this is the same church that was established by Jesus Christ on that rock. Well, where's the, well, and I, I've got one question for you, but I just want to speak, speak to that. I wasn't referring to like colloquial expressions or, or something like that, as you mentioned with Paul. I'm talking about the utilization of various different orthodoxies and heresies and competing heterodox and orthodox principles that still allowed Christianity in its fundamental, most basic sense to spread. For example, I don't consider myself a Christian at all. I consider myself a Latter-day Saint or a Mormon. We talked about that. The reason is, is that Christianity carries with it so much baggage nowadays. And I don't, I don't accept a lot of it because I don't agree in the truth with the Trinity. I think we're one of the few churches that doesn't accept the Trinity um, with respect to the singular claim of a concluded canon or a closed canon of scripture, we reject that as well. And so either one of those principles will, will kind of pull us out of the baggage that's required. So if I tell somebody, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, they get confused when I, when I reject the Trinity and I don't believe the Bible is infallible or other beliefs they may have about it. So that's, that's one principle. What I'm saying is, is that the Sabellians and the Arians continue to spread Christianity across the empire. Were their views correct? No, maybe, who knows? But you can't, you can't really say yes or no. That it, that it didn't win out doesn't mean it wasn't correct. That's my point. That's an argument from silence. That's an argument from, well, popularity is the popularity contest that helps things to defeat other things. Now, with respect to the rock being the revelation, I'm not, I'm not appealing to any kind of subjectivity in the text because here you've got Christ being declared as the, the living, son of the living God, him saying, because my father revealed it to you and him saying, and upon this rock, I will build my church. So what exactly is the rock? Why is he referencing a rock and what is that rock? The fact that Peter is called Rocky effectively in the Greek doesn't mean that Peter was the rock because Peter died. That can't be the foundation of a church. So it must be appealing to some other principle. And my question is, what's the principle? And the, for us, the principle is revelation, which is clearly manifested from the text. Now you can agree and disagree and say that that's an interpretation, that's fine. But that's the distinction. We're left with interpretation. And that's why, that's why the prophetic voice is so important and consistent throughout scripture. Now you keep saying, I can't point to who the prophet is. I'm not saying that I can't make a case that Peter, who we actually acknowledge was the prophet, is the prophet. What I'm saying is, is that's not like an objective argument. I can point to this exact verse and say, see here, Jesus is calling Peter to be the head of the church. Gave him the keys of the kingdom, right? And you could say, no, you're going to need more than that, or that's not really think, because now we're arguing interpretation. 
And I'm saying I don't do that because my faith tradition rejects that. Arguing the interpretation of these old texts is not what we do. We believe in a living, revealed church, not what some dead old guys said. That's what constitutes the restoration and what previously constituted apostasy. Old clerics appealing to what old guys said a long time ago and trying to quote mine and use academia and scholarship to figure out what they meant is no way to run God's church. Why don't we just ask God? And you're saying we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, so how do you reconcile if you disagree with something somebody else says in the church, in the Orthodox faith? Um, you would probably, I mean, it would depend on what it is and you would appeal to your, I mean, if it was me and like Joe Bob or something and we had a disagreement, I would appeal to our parish priest. And if that was unsatisfactory, then, you know, you could take it up with uh, the, boy, I, I don't know. I, I imagine there's a hierarchy, scripture, ecumenical councils, and the church fathers. Now, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the calling it a dead faith and dead old guys, it's like God says he's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. We don't believe that those who are in Christ are dead. That's part of why we ask the saints to pray for us. That's part of why we, we through revelation, uh, accept that Christ, the Holy Spirit, even as a uh, Bishop Alexander in the deposition of Arius, St. Paul was uh, helping to guide the Nicene Council. So this, this idea that uh, revelation has ceased in the Orthodox Church is just not true. We don't have prophets in the Old Testament sense, and that's because the Old Testament prophets were all pointing toward Christ. Now that Christ has come, we have the church, we have Christ himself, and yes, we have prophets with a lowercase p would be the distinction we make. Yes, we have saints with a lowercase s. We're all saints. We're all saints in utero, to borrow a, a Mormon turn of phrase. We're all called to be saints. We're all called to be sanctified. And so um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to the rest of your stuff. I think we should start wrapping up now because I think it's been about two and a half hours. So yeah, it's been about that. I, I wanted to ask you a question about the veneration of saints and how okay. that plays into it. Where's the, where's the, where's the developmental, I mean, what's your theology on that? I know that the Catholics use saints as intercessors to some degree that they pray to them, I suppose, um, in some regard that they have patron saints and specific things and functions. Is the Orthodox faith consistent with that kind of an understanding or is it different? Um, I, I'll explain it. Let me just uh, go go back. I, I wanted to address some of the things you said, and then I'm happy to respond to that question. And then we okay. can like, kind of like wrap it up because I'm really hungry. Yeah. I haven't eaten want, dinner. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't, I really don't want this to go to John, three you don't hours. Have to eat. You don't have to eat very much. <laughs> I know, I know. I need to eat less of anything. Um, so heterodox and orthodox principles, um, how would you tell them how would you tell the difference I think you were talking about? No, 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 um, I, I wasn't, but sure. Okay, well, then I'll just skip that. Um, you brought up the example, uh, baggage associated with Christianity, why you don't associate with uh, Christianity. This is oh, a no, really- I, I, I don't identify as a Christian. As a Christian, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, the, the only thing I wanted to say to that is I, I can kind of identify with where you're coming from on that, um, just because like I personally see- American Christianity as an atheism factory. I see people responding to American Christianity as you normally think of it. And they say, good God, I do not want to be a part of that. And so if that's not true, then what else could be true? And so they end up falling into atheism. Um, the other thing I wanted to respond to is a concluded canon. Um, I don't see how the conclusion of canon is indicative of a universal apostasy. Uh, maybe this could be what we wrap up with after we talk okay. about saints, um, because I see uh, the conclusion of the canon uh, being evidence for a universal apostasy. I find that idea to be arbitrary. Um, I don't see anywhere in scripture or in the early church fathers that indicates that scripture should continue. Like you rightly pointed out earlier, um, we didn't have uh, a canon until the 
what, mid or late 300s, we canonized the scripture and we did so with criteria that you mentioned. It had to be written before uh, 100 AD, I think was one. It had to be written by an apostle or a scribe of an apostle. And it had to be something generally accepted by the church. Um, <clears throat> it had to be something that was accepted by the whole church. So for what the New Testament is all about and what it's trying to do, um, we, we don't see any need to continue beyond that. We have the ecumenical councils. We have various councils that are authoritative to a degree. We have uh, the saints of the church. We have the church itself. And uh, just wrapping up on this like response segment, um, you know, talking about how we can't prove that Sibelianism is wrong or the Arians are wrong. I would say we absolutely can prove that some of these heresies, if not all of them, are incorrect. And I would point to Sibelianism because that was the first one you brought up. Sibelianism, modalism, patropassianism, these are heresies which essentially say that God is one hypostasis, that God is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are essentially masks that God wears. So God the Father actually suffered on the cross. Um, this is stuff that like you can disprove pretty darn easily through scripture. And it was refuted very early on. And I think you can take the same approach to Arianism. Um, and then wrapping up on this, and then I'll let you respond. I know I'm kind of going crazy here. You're fine. But uh, just regarding the intercession of saints, um, I'll, I'll make it brief. We, as I said, believe that God, as per scripture, is the God of the living, not of the dead, and those who are in Christ are alive in Christ. We believe that the saints are in Christ, and they're alive in Christ. Uh, in Revelation, you see the saints are praying to God. Um, our liturgy, everything that we've preserved from the Old Testament church into the New Testament church is a reflection of the church in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a reflection of the kingdom of earth. And so we're doing things in much the same way. And so I, I think it's noteworthy that the saints are praying in heaven. What are they praying? They're praying for us. They're offering um, oblations. They're offering incense. Um, they have an altar, all of this kind of thing. So as, as we hear in James, this, uh, this, this sentiment that you, we should pray for each other. We should pray for each other, and he says, the prayers of a righteous person, uh, I'm paraphrasing, the prayers of a righteous person in particular are very effective. So we just view praying to the saints uh, essentially as just asking the saints to pray for us. This isn't eliminating the sole mediatorship of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the sole mediator, mediator but this also doesn't rule out that as St. James says, we should pray for each other. So we don't afford the same respect or worship or anything like that to the saints. Okay, I understand that. Um, I was just looking at, I, I, well, I had, I had was looking at that. I was thinking of that as a, as a particular point of debate, but, and I looked at the, the OCA.org website with respect to veneration of the saints. And I was just curious, it indicates that that practice has been happening for 2,000 years. I don't know if you've got any evidence of that happening for 2,000 years and when that started, when that began, and what, what you would point to as support for that. But for me, the, the concept itself is, I mean, I praying for and having others pray for you, I mean, that's not something you could ever speak to actually occurring or knowing whether it's happening. Um, and it kind of cast a shadow of the relationship that a person should have directly with God. Um, our belief is, is that because of the atonement, we don't have to pray through anybody or we can, we, we can brought to, in the way that way that we phrase it is we, we come boldly before the throne of grace. And I think evangelicals would agree with us on that. I don't have to even pray through Christ. I pray to God, the father directly. Um, and that's been afforded to me because of the atonement. So I, I'm not sure if you've got something you can support the veneration of saints being a 2,000 year old practice. I, I don't see any evidence of that in in any texts. It's certainly not something that appears in the New Testament. Yes, yeah. we we have it in uh, I believe it's Second Maccabees. You have prayers for the dead. 
We have attestation of intercessory prayer from the Shepherd of Hermas, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Cyprian of Carthage, um, various anonymous Christian writings, Methodius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Hilary of Poitiers. Um, and these are all, if I recall right, completely uh, anti-Nicene, pre-Nicene church fathers. Do you have one for like, I mean, so what, what are the sort, like, what did Origen say, for example? What's the, what's the statement? Uh, let me see if I can. Or any of them, any of those sorts of what, what exactly is it you're citing to? I couldn't find anything. I, I don't know of anything that's anti nicene Why did I X out of this uh, tab? I had some tabs open. I know. What the early right. church fathers believed apostolic succession, Talmadge, apostasy. I didn't think this was going to be a, uh, a, a uh, you know, something we talked about in depth. So I, I guess I didn't leave the tab open. I can oh, provide those. Fine. I can provide those yeah, to you should, after should, if you yeah, like. Yeah, give me something later. Yeah, because I'd like to read the quotes. Um, if you want to, how do you want to do this closing? Do you want to just, I'll speak my piece, you speak yours, we salute each other and I go home? Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. I'm my, just gonna... wife is, my wife is texting me to come home. I'm just going to leave a note to send you that document. Okay, go ahead, sir. Um, just in conclusion, I, I mean, again, it's not a formal debate. I mean, there wasn't really an allocation of a burden of proofs. So I don't know that we're, we're doing other than just trying to, to, to provide a support for a position that we hold. Um, mine, of course, is that there was, in fact, a universal apostasy. I think that despite some of the arguments that you've made to the contrary, um, some of the admissions that you've made demonstrate that it's really not any different than any other faith tradition would make, which you would also agree are an apostasy. So for example, one of the, one of the big problems is, is that when you collect a group of, of texts to canonize them, and then you refer back to them, you stated, you stated that some of, the, some of the arguments that you would use to, to argue against some of the early heresies, as they're called, modalism and Sibelianism and Patripassianism, um, the Gnostics and other groups that, that developed different theologies, Arius and, and, and those and the like, even Origen uh, believed things that he was chastised. And uh, for example, uh, my understanding is he had a belief in some kind of a pre-existent state, but those beliefs were, were disputed with because they weren't found in scripture. And that alone is the problem because what you've got is you've got a consensus of human beings sitting around saying that somebody who perhaps received something for maybe by revelation. So an example would be, let's say, and again, I'm not clear on this, people can chide me, but let's say for the sake of argument, Origen did believe that there was a pre-existence, which the Latter-day Saints also accept. And we do that for purposes of the fact that if anybody wants to message me later, um, find me on Facebook, because Without a pre-existence, there's actually no purpose to life. I, I, I have yet to have any, anybody from any faith tradition explain why we exist without that belief system. But let's say Origen, in reading the texts, in communing with the Holy Spirit, receives knowledge that there is, in fact, a pre-existent state. And that theology needs to be explored and developed. But instead of being explored and developed, those are in the circles around you say, no, you're in heresy, you're in apostasy, you need to stop believing that, we're going to excommunicate you. How on earth is there supposed to be a situation wherein ideas can be explored and God can free flow reveal to these authoritative figures if those are the consequences of their belief systems? They're simply excommunicated or exiled, which is what happened to many of the um, the church fathers and other bishops as they espoused theological positions which were considered not apostolic or not scriptural. You, you identified the criteria for what constitutes scripture. Those are well known to me. I understand why they applied the criteria they did to develop a canon, but the very act of doing that rejects an ongoing scriptural canon saying that there's nothing to indicate that that should continue has two problems. One, it reflects an understanding that there ever should be such a thing as a canon or scripture. 
that Paul was writing letters that somebody wrote about the life of Jesus in a document called a gospel doesn't mean that that constitutes the final word on anything, particularly not in faith and practice and principle with respect to your relationship with Jesus. The second problem with it is, is it formulates a circular argument. You've got somebody who's using a text that they've decided to be the authoritative text for what they've decided. And that's the definition of it. I often post a little meme that says, the Bible is the word of God because the Bible says it's the word of God because the Bible is the word of God because the Bible says it's the word of God. Those appeals back to scripture are, are circular. The reality of it is, is as I was trying to demonstrate with Matthew 16, scripture points away from itself to God as the source of truth and revelation. Those who continue to believe that they can reveal and have revealed to them by God what truths should be taught and practices and principles, whether or not the ordinances should change. For example, we talked specifically about the ordinance of baptism. You've left a big question mark. Your church doesn't have an answer for a question that I believe is very important. Did Is baptism actually a commandment? Is it actually necessary? And if so, how does everybody on the planet accomplish it. We see evidences of a principle called baptism for the dead, which again, using your term robust, is a robust and developed theology within the Latter-day Saint tradition. We understand why and how the Lord, through the principle of vicarious proxy, can accomplish the commandment to give baptism to all people. There's a scripture in Second Nephi that's often quoted that says, and, and I, Nephi, um, it says, I, I, uh, now it's not escaped my, escaped my head, but it's, uh, I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them to accomplish it. I think that that's very, very important today because you've got this principle of God giving commandments and then basically a shrug of the shoulder that, oh, he'll make an allowance for you not to follow it because, you know, we can't follow it. Why then would he give the commandment if he didn't expect people to be able to follow it? Why would he allow somebody who, as you stated, is on the path to righteousness, has the ability to continue that path throughout, which I would agree is a correct principle of eternal progression, we call it. If somebody dies on the path, would they continue that? Certainly. So a good man who didn't hear about Christ dies, he gets to continue that path. The problem with that is, is there's no way in which you can either know that that's occurring. It's never been revealed that that's occurring. And if you try to develop any kind of theology, you have to point back to texts, which you agree are silent on that point. And you have to kind of develop something after the fact or come up with some shrug of the shoulder argument. I think that all of these various question marks that occur as a result of it, in addition to the very clear statements from the Orthodox Church of America with respect to the nature of God. We've got Christ himself saying that God is supposed to be known and knowable, that to know God is life eternal. And the idea that he's speaking to his living apostles is evidence that that is a principle that should have survived. But here we have a God who is unknown, unknowable, and incomprehensible as a result. We believe that that's universal throughout most of Christianity and therefore constitutes a very universal apostasy. Now, I wanted to mention briefly the, the, um, the idea of, of my statement that they're old dead guys. I didn't mean that literally. Obviously, I don't believe that Paul is an old dead guy. In fact, in our own church history, there are recurring accounts of Moses, Elijah, a prophet named Elias, and Abraham and Paul, um, as well as prophets that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon, uh, actually appearing to and revealing either priesthood authority or doctrines to Joseph Smith. So certainly we would agree with that as messengers, as angels sent from the presence of God, they're tasked with that responsibility. So we believe in that they are alive and living. The big difficulty with it is, is we would reject almost we would reject the idea that the texts that they remained behind are God's word and exclusively God's word. 
we wouldn't agree that ecumenical councils would supplant that principle. And I think that the, the apostasy was pretty, pretty well established and universal in that way. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to respond and then we can say our goodbyes. Um, so as far as I see it, we've seen that Mormonism, uh, its ecclesiology is something that isn't present in the New Testament church. We've seen that scripture clearly rules out the idea that Jesus' church would fail or fall into apostasy completely, no matter how you slice it. Um, we have a church that traces its lines of priesthood ordination directly back to the apostles and operates under the very same principles, teachings, and ecclesiology established by the apostles themselves. We have a church that maintains key elements of Old Testament worship, and we have a tried and true and scriptural way to resolve these controversies, i.e. ecumenical councils um, given to us by precedent of Acts 15. There's nothing to indicate that a canon should continue. Um, the Bible is the word of God, yes, and it's circular, but all arguments, I think, are ultimately circular, at least somewhat. If we rely on God alone, which usually translates to our idea of God to reveal truth, then we run the risk of being deceived by demons or our own ideas, as Muhammad was, Joseph Smith, and so many of these other charismatic and effective false prophets were. Holy tradition preserved these teachings because not everybody was literate. So for a long time, there wasn't even a canon. There were uh, generally accepted um, books, letters, epistles that were useful. And it would be, when it became necessary and appropriate, the church canonized the scriptures for the use of the church. When thinking of how to determine the truth, where are we to go then? Um, the truth of Christian truth claims, I think, should be weighed against scripture, first and foremost, and then history. And your emotions, your personal spiritual experiences are always going to be a major factor in this search for truth. I don't deny that. But I'm saying if we rely on the heart alone, that is going to be uh, something that puts our, our salvation in jeopardy. It's going to be something that is ultimately anti or, you know, incoherent with scripture. Uh, scripture tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things. So uh, these things need to be approached with, uh, what would you say, temperance? And with that, I would just say, um, make, your own <laughs> make your own investigation into the truth. And, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, um, if anybody is watching, you know, this is uh, stuff that you may see is totally superfluous, something totally unrelatable. Um, because I know a lot of you probably aren't Orthodox or aren't LDS, but uh, this stuff does have big ramifications within our respective circles uh, because they ultimately affect whether or not <laughs> his church is true or mine. Um, but as far as the, the salvific, the salvation topic, um, I would just say seek truth and a relationship with God, whatever that means to you. Um, investigate Orthodoxy. It's something that we need absolutely in this day and age but well, i um, well I'm, I'm not to cut you off but i just wanted to just real quick um if anybody wants to discuss i guess with john or i um john's pretty easy to, to catch because he's got his his uh youtube channel and his his uh, facebook page i'm just travis anderson on facebook i'm the guy that always has a rick and morty as a profile picture so if you would like me to link reach out to me if you would like me to link something of yours i can do that in the description of the video anything I'm you'd like look i'm not arguing i'm explaining <laughs> <laughs> i just have a crucifix man that's all simple yeah. and humble I, I don't worship idols <laughs> <laughs> luckily i don't either <laughs> i know no you're fine <laughs> okay all right thank you so much travis um this has been good i'm glad that we had a uh productive and fruitful dialogue. And this was a, a surprisingly, um, I think, meaningful experience. Yeah, I think that I think we ought to do it again. If I mean, certainly, um, with the coming of your little one, um, not too soon, but um, we ought to do it again, have another discussion, pick another topic. It was fun. Yeah, wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much. And uh, God bless.